The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled Promoting American Jobs Reauthorization of the U.S. Export-Import Bank. I will now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Today, this committee convenes for a hearing to discuss the revival and long-term reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank which plays an important role in the U.S. government's effort to support American jobs, maintains the vital, vi, vi, validity rather, of critical industry sectors, and thwarts the movement of manufacturing production overseas. For 85 years, the XM Bank has helped U.S. exporters compete in the global markets by assuming credit risk, and the private sector is unable or unwilling to accept. And by helping U.S. firms compete on an equal footing against foreign competitors who have access to generous export financing through their own government export credit agencies. Over the last 10 years, XM financed more than $255 billion in U.S. exports, supported more than 1.5 million American jobs, and remitted more than $3.4 billion in deficit-reducing receipts to the Treasury. Despite its numerous contributions to our economy, this critically important institution has repeatedly found itself under attack. In July 2015, the previous chairman of this committee allowed the bank's charter to lapse for the first time in the bank's 81-year history. After months of hard work, Representatives Heck, Moore, Harya, and I joined an overwhelming majority of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle in voting to renew XM's operating charter through September 30th, 2019. The reauthorization legislation mandated a number of important reforms, including provisions to boost the share of financing for small businesses and ensure that XM maintains its fiscal soundness. Although XM has finally been reauthorized, Republican Senate leadership refused to confirm the directors of XM's board and thereby denying the board the required quorum to approve transactions over $10 million. Without the ability to consider the full range of transactions pending approval, XM reported that $40 billion worth of transactions, which would support an estimated 250,000 jobs, languished in its approval pipeline. Fortunately, last month, the Senate finally confirmed three new board members of XM Bank reviving the agency. Failure to reauthorize and strengthen XM would result in the loss of tens of thousands of jobs as U.S. exporters suffer declining overseas. This includes thousands of small and medium-sized businesses across the country. Without a strong and competitive XM, companies may be forced to move jobs to locations where export credit is still available and American workers will suffer. Additionally, this will undermine America's manufacturing base, which in turn will negatively impact America's industrial production capacity that is critical to our economic growth and international competitiveness. So I look forward to today, today's discussion on ways to support U.S. workers and ensure our exporters <clears throat> will get the certainty they need to grow, compete globally, and keep good jobs here at home. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, I thank the chairwoman, and I, and I appreciate uh, her, her organizing this, this very uh, distinguished panel today, and I appreciate the panel being here. Uh, the Export-Import Bank can trace its origins back to the 1930s. One of its first loans was extended to China for the construction of the Burma Road, an important supply route when China found itself at war with Japan and certainly a hard-fought path during World War II. I raise this example to underscore how much has changed in the intervening eight decades, but also to highlight what must remain constant as we approach a reauthorization of XM. Our relations with China and Japan, not to mention their internal governance, have undergone a dramatic transformation since XM's founding. But the use of XM as a tool of our, inter of our national interest and even our national security interest has increased importance today. China 
is providing unparalleled levels of export subsidies for its companies, especially its state-owned enterprises, with the goal of dominating the technologies of tomorrow and extending its influence through the Belt and Road Initiative. In the face of this challenge, no one expects the Export-Import Bank to single-handedly neutralize China's efforts. But as we continue to examine how to uh, modernize XM, it's imperative that we look reality in the eye and adapt the bank to the present day. This means focusing XM on the exports of the future. It means supporting jobs that are central to the, cultural, uh, the culture of uh, competitiveness and innovation. This is how XM can best advance U.S. leadership in the face of China's plans. At the same time, we have to recognize that our competitiveness is not just a product of America's largest companies, but also springs from our startups and small businesses, a unique source of vigor that distinguishes us not just from China, but from every other country on the globe. I'm confident that members from both parties want to ensure that XM allows our small exporters to grow and flourish by seeking out new markets. Let me conclude by noting that while XM must be better adapted to confront Beijing's ambitions, we continue to hope for a future where the Chinese government joins the international order and adheres to the standards of developed nations, including standards governing export subsidies. As we know, on this day, 30 years ago, the Communist Party trampled on its people's calls for reform in the Tiananmen Square massacre, the remembrance of which is still suppressed to this day by leaders in Beijing. So while we continue to work towards a peaceful and constructive relationship with China, I hope we will remain clear-eyed about the nature of its regime especially as we consider how to employ XM's resources much more strategically going forward. I yield to the uh, subcommittee ranking member on this very subject, uh, Leader uh, Steve Stivers. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member McHenry. I uh, want to thank the chair for calling this hearing today. Uh, as everyone knows, we don't have much time to reauthorize the XM Bank. In 2017, China's export credit agencies provided approximately $36 billion in medium and long-term financing uh, to support its manufacturers. Meanwhile, the United States XM Bank deployed approximately $200 million of assistance to American exporters. China's aggressively pursuing a comprehensive industrial st strategy, China 2025, to erode America's industrial base and dominate technologies for the 21st century. If we're going to fight back, we need to recognize that modernizing and strengthening the XM Bank is part of what we have to do, and it's a national security issue. Uh, while we do this, we can also support efforts that makes up, make XM more transparent and accountable to taxpayers. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the unfair advantage that uh, foreign export credit agencies have in providing uh, support to their manufacturers and how we can reform and strengthen our XM Bank to level the playing field for American employers and the American economy. Thank you. I yield the gentleman his time back. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, Mr. Cleaver, for one minute. Madam Chair, uh, this is a, an important uh, piece of legislation for the people of the 5th District and for the state of Missouri. Missouri. Uh, we have a, a significant number of uh, companies who are involved with, the, uh, with Boeing who are doing uh, significant amounts of, of money uh, and hiring as a result of the uh, XM uh, uh, activity. And uh, it would be my hope that uh, we can get this uh, bill out of committee on the floor and uh, through the Senate. Uh, a lot depends on it. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I want to welcome uh, today's distinguished panel. Linda Mengetti Dempsey, Vice President, International Economic Affairs National Association for Manufacturers. Owen Harenstadt, Chief of Staff of the International President, International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, David Henson, Vice President, Institute for Diversity and Emerging Business, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Roy Kamphausen, 
Commissioner at the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, Archana Sharma, CEO, AKAS, Tex LLC, a textile manufacturer and exporter based in Pennsylvania, Stephen Wilburn, CEO, Firm Green Incorporated, an integrated energy company focusing on green technology and alternative fuels based in California. Without objection, all of your written statements will be made a part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear at that time. I would ask you to wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of both the witnesses and the committee members' time. Ms. Dempsey, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to be here today on behalf of the National Association of Manufacturers, the largest manufacturing association in the country. I'm here because the 14,000 manufacturers we represent, small and large, in every industrial sector and in all 50 states, and the more than 12.8 million women and men who make things in America depend on the ability to sell overseas and to be globally competitive. Access to foreign markets is critical to growing manufacturing in the United States getting innovative products to consumers, and creating good, high-paying jobs. The United States has the world's most productive manufacturing sector, but the U.S. market represents only 10% of global consumption. Our manufacturers need to be globally competitive to reach customers outside of our country if we're going to keep growing. As the official export credit agency of the United States, the Export-Import Bank operates as the lender of last resort for thousands of U.S. exporters that cannot obtain financing or related services from commercial banks. For the exporters that use this tool, it is often, often the difference between winning and losing a deal and growing or risking jobs. That's why manufacturers are grateful that the Senate confirmed the three nominees to the Exim Board last month, and the agency is now fully functional for the first time since 2015. I've outlined in my written testimony the many reforms the Exim Bank has implemented in, as a uh, pursuant to the 2015 reauthorization, including working to expand usage by small businesses, heightening the Exim Bank's risk and ethics controls, prohibiting discrimination against any eligible exporter, and keeping Congress better informed of its activities. Many of these ref reforms awaited the installation of the new quorum, and their impact is only just starting to be felt. Now we're asking Congress to revitalize and reauthorize the Exim Bank quickly to provide certainty and a level playing field for manufacturers in America. The Exim Bank serves several critical roles that fill gaps when commercial financing is not available. It supports small and medium-sized exporters that can't obtain working capital financing and, and guarantees. It also supports exporters of all sizes that require longer-term financing for large deals, financing to sales to emerging markets, and support for sales to foreign state-owned entities. Since 2000, the exports made possible by the Exim Bank have supported more than 2.5 million American jobs. Last year, more than 90% of the Exim Bank's transactions directly supported small businesses, and many more small businesses benefit when our larger companies can export more. Action to revitalize and reauthorize the Exim Bank is also critical, given the unprecedented challenges that manufacturers face in the global economy. There are more than 100 foreign export credit agencies around the world working to support their country's manufacturers at the expense of ours. When U.S. businesses can't bid on or finance overseas projects or secure foreign sales in the absence of Exim, other countries are more than happy to fill the void. The NAM estimates that during the nearly four years that Exim Board lacked a quorum and the ability to fully operate, manufacturers lost at least 119 million billion, I'm sorry, in manufacturing output and the loss of 80,000 jobs in 2016 and 17 alone. These losses are particularly hard for small and medium-sized businesses and the broader industrial base. Meanwhile, China, India, Korea, and others have been growing their export credit agencies substantially, both for commercial and other national interests. China's total medium and long-term export assistance totaled more than the rest of the world combined in FY 2017. China has used its financing to advance its economic and geopolitical interests. In one instance, its massive loans won foreign government approval of a Chinese military base adjacent to America's only permanent military installation in Africa. This issue, however, is much larger than just China, and it's much larger than our economy. 
When America fails to lead, other nations fill the vacuum. Unless Congress takes action to reauthorize and revitalize the Exim Bank quickly, our country's standing in the world will falter. So here's what manufacturers are asking of Congress. Reauthorize the Exim Bank for a significant term. Fix the quorum issue to avoid costly disruptions. Revitalize the Exim Bank's mission to help counter the growing challenge of state-directed export financing. And continue to ensure the Exim Bank promotes exports by all eligible exporters without hampering its ability and flexibility to help manufacturers of all man sizes and types. Proposals to restrict usage by particular firms and industries through strict concentration or similar limits would undermine Exim's mission and America's ability to compete globally to the detriment of manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hernstadt, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you, to, you today on the vital importance of the Export-Import Bank in promoting American jobs. The International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers represents hundreds of thousands of workers in North America. Our members produce, service, assemble, and transport products, parts, and assemblies that create the global economy. They are responsible for the success of many of this nation's leading export industries. Given our members' work in the export industries, we are uniquely positioned to share with you our strong support for the bank so that it can continue its critical commission, mission of supporting U.S. jobs by finan financing exports that meet strong U.S. employment policy requirements, including those concerning domestic content. We need a fully funded and reauthorized Exim Bank now more than ever. Global competition has never been more intense, and the stakes for our economy have never been higher as U.S. firms and U.S. workers struggle to compete in today's global marketplace. As just mentioned, many other countries have implemented their own policies and industries that promote domestic industries and employment, including Germany, France, Italy, Japan, and China, to name a few. Unlike these other countries, the U.S. has only one government institution that supports U.S. exporters and U.S. workers, the Exim Bank. Since the Exim Bank began in the 1930s, its mission has been to support U.S. exports that support U.S. workers. The bank's efforts, as noted, have been stymied over the past few years by delaying authorization and then by preventing the existence of its quorum of its board of directors. During this period, companies have been looking at companies have announced closures of facilities while they are struggling to find financing. While uncertainty over the Exim Bank's future continues, export credit agencies in other countries have become more and more aggressive, as has already been noted. Aerospace is one of the principal targets of foreign ECAs, as noted in Exim's report on global export competition. China's use of ECAs is of special concern given the massive amount of financing that they are providing their export industries and the lack of transparency. While we don't know a lot about the financing, what we do know is of serious concern. We know that China has focused hundreds of billions of ECA uh, dollars on its export industries. As the bank notes, Chinese activity now accounts for roughly 40% of global total trade for medium and long-term support. China's ECA's mandates uh, support uh, for uh, its own one belt, one road initiative. Now, some critics of the Exim Bank want to eliminate the export credit financing entirely. They argue that if no country can engage in this activity, no country will be able to use ECAs to promote their own industries and employment. Their criticism is based on two presumptions. First, they presume that all countries will agree to eliminate export credit agencies, which is seriously doubtful. Second, they presume that the elimination of export credit agencies will eliminate other countries' efforts to support their own industries and employment. Unlike the U.S., however, as Europe's Strategic Aerospace Review for the 21st Century and China's Made in China 25 efforts clearly indicate, other countries utilize comprehensive policies that are not limited to ECAs to support their own industries and employment. As indicated at the outset, 
The IAM support for the Exim Bank is directly linked to strong public policies that support U.S. employment, like domestic content and shipping requirements. Strong domestic content means that a greater percentage of the product for export is made here in the U.S. Strong shipping requirements means that U.S. workers on U.S. flag ships, not foreign workers on foreign flag ships, will transport the Exim Bank financed exports. Past efforts to weaken these essential public policies should continue to be rejected if at all raised. If domestic content and U.S. shipping requirements are weakened in any way, U.S. workers will suffer. Moreover, U.S. taxpayers, including the U.S. workers whose jobs are at stake, should not have to question whether their hard-earned money is going to create jobs here at home or in other countries. The IAM strongly urges this committee to act as quickly as possible to simply, cleanly, fully reauthorize the Exim Bank with strong U.S. employment policies. Thank you, Mr. Herrenstadt. Mr. Henson, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Madam Chair Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and distinguished members of the committee, I am pleased to testify today on the importance of reauthorizing the Export-Import Bank. I am here on behalf of the United States Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest business advocacy organization, which represents the interest of over three million businesses of every size, sector, and in every state. I also come to you as the former national director of the Minority Business Development Agency in the U.S. Department of Commerce, where I focused on supporting the unique export capabilities of our nation's 11 million minority-owned and operated businesses. You've heard the fundamentals of the ongoing debate on XM reauthorization. XM provides financing and guarantees for exporters that directly supports American jobs at no cost to the U.S. taxpayer. Nearly 90% of XM transactions are with small and medium-sized businesses, and approximately 20% of XM transactions are with women-owned and minority-owned businesses. What is alarming the business community today is the idea that U.S. companies will be forced to operate in the ultra-competitive global marketplace without an official export credit agency. Consider how this would put specific sectors and industries at a competitive disadvantage. First, shutting down XM would mean many small businesses couldn't export at all because commercial banks often refuse to accept foreign receivables as collateral for a loan without an XM guarantee. For these small businesses, XM isn't just a nice to have, it is critical to the success of their export opportunities. Second, it is common for expensive capital goods such as Canadian airplanes, Chinese trains, and Russian nuclear reactors to be sold worldwide with backing from their national export credit agencies. Even before the lapse in XM's charter in 2015, major tenders for locomotives, turbines, jets, and nuclear reactors were slipping away from U.S. exporters. These tenders worth hundreds of millions of dollars require that the supplier finance a significant portion of the transaction. Chinese competition in particular has been fierce, and they come, with well, they come well prepared with generous financing from one or several Chinese government-sponsored export credit agencies. Again, for large ticket purposes, the calculus could not be more clear. No XM, no sale. Another example of a sector that would be decimated by the loss of XM is the nuclear power industry. Nearly all business opportunities in nuclear power are overseas and export credit agency support is required simply to bid on a nuclear power plant tender. So for many companies in the U.S. nuclear industry, which directly employs more than 100,000 Americans in high-skilled, high-paying jobs, it's essentially the XM bank or die. Finally, the XM bank is vital to the growth of minority-owned and women-owned exporters. According to the most recent statistics, there are over 28,000 minority-owned exporters, a growing number of which are African-American-owned and Hispanic-owned companies, and 30,000 women-owned exporters. These firms export products and services valued well in excess of $30 billion. They export to over 100 countries, and they export products ranging from airline spare parts to wellness and nutritional products. These companies rely almost exclusively on XM credit and insurance products to support their growth. As many diverse companies export to emerging markets, XM Bank is their sole source of export financing support. In an environment where minority-owned and women-owned companies continue to struggle with access to capital, 
Not authorizing the Exim Bank would serve to further cripple the growth of America's job-creating diverse businesses. In closing, Exim is vital to leveling the playing field for U.S. exporters. The discussion should not be if the Exim Bank should or should not be reauthorized. The discussion should be around how do we reposition Exim to be more effective, efficient, and responsive to the needs of small, medium size, and the growing number of women-owned and minority-owned exporters so that they are better positioned to sell their U.S. products and services to the 95% of the world's consumers that live outside of the United States. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce looks forward to working with Congress to secure XM's reauthorization before September 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henson. Mr. Kamhausen, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to share my views on China's economic policy as reflected in its Belt and Road Initiative, important context for your deliberations regarding reauthorization of Exim Bank. These views are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S.-China Economic and Security View Commission, where I serve as a commissioner, although they are certainly informed by the commission's body of past and ongoing work. My testimony is also informed by my work at the National Bureau of Asian Research, which has done important studies on the Belt and Road Initiative, including the, the seminal study on the Belt and Road, China's Eurasian Century, written by my colleague Nadej Rolan. A year and a half ago, in testimony before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, I argued that the BRI represents a test case for China's vision for a new international order throughout Eurasia and possibly even the world. Today, China has demonstrated that it intends for the BRI to be not merely a regional initiative, but a global one. China has extended the BRI into the Western Hemisphere, Europe, and the Arctic, and has launched what it calls a digital Silk Road and even a space Silk Road. More broadly, China has used the BRI to promote its global in influence in areas from increasing market access and setting standards for emerging technologies to controlling global media markets, exporting authoritarian enabling surveillance technology, and so forth. Indeed, Chinese President and Communist Party General Secretary Xi Jinping declared last year that the initiative serves as a solution for China to improve global economic governance and build a, quote, community of common human destiny, a concept breathtaking in breadth and scale to recast the international system in China's mold. Let me briefly focus on several factors. First, although Chinese officials like to talk up BRI as a boon to global development, and BRI investment may well provide some of the necessary resources for urgent infrastructure invest investment shortfalls throughout Eurasia, from Beijing's perspective, BRI is designed primarily to boost the competitiveness and innovative capacity of Chinese companies by opening up new markets and then promoting adoption of Chinese technology standards there. BRI is closely aligned with China's economic development plans, such as the 13th Five-Year Plan and the Made in China 2025 initiative. Indeed, BRI directly targets at least half of the 10 key high technology sectors in the Made in China 2025 strategy. Telecommunications is a particularly notable example of China's efforts to sell technology in BRI markets and beyond, where companies like Huawei, China Mobile, and ZTE um, set standards, and then dominate markets as Chinese national champions. Now, China's policy and state-owned commercial banks do not operate the same way as banks in liberal economies do. Policy, not profit maximization in all cases, under, underpins decision-making. In practice, this means that favored industries and companies like Huawei often receive subsidized financing, and projects promoted by the government get preferential access to capital. BRI is also a tool to promote political and military influence. In countries from Africa to Europe and the Western Hemisphere, China has used BRI partnerships to expand its influence into local media markets and export digital surveillance technology and other means of social control. As China has perfected its application of these tools at home, including the use of AI and big data to support its detention of more than a million Uyghurs in Western China, it has also increasingly exported these surveillance methods abroad, including through the digital Silk Road. On the security side, Chinese leaders have reinforced the military significance of the BRI and potentially potential military utility of BRI investments in ports, 
airports and railways. Now, almost from its inception, BRI has raised concerns, questionable projects and terms, use of Chinese companies and workers, and debt sustainability issues. Indeed, most of China's state lending overseas is based on commercial, non-concessional terms and frequently can create debt sustainability issues. China often makes deals that are disadvantageous to local countries, and in recent year, months we've seen pushback from countries like Malaysia, Myanmar, and Kazakhstan. Despite concerns, BRI remains a means for extending China's political, economic, and military influence abroad. The geographic ambition and variety and scale of projects may make it seem like BRI is an insurmountable challenge to the global liberal order. This is not yet true, but the U.S. and her allies must be vigilant in monitoring Chinese activities and relentless in protecting our interests. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kamphausen. Ms. Sharma, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to testify about how we work with the U.S. Export-Import Bank and how it has helped us. I came to the United States in 2005 from India with my husband and children. We were both high-ranking professionals in India. I found employment as Director of Quality Control at Osteotech Inc., later Medtronic, a company that makes medical devices from donated human bones and tissues. My husband is a textile engineer who found work in a textile manufacturing company in New Jersey, which declared bankruptcy and closed in 2010. That's when we decided to get into manufacturing our own fabrics. Recession was at full peak and no bank was willing to lend us the money. We took a leap of faith and invested our entire savings in our business. Our first batches were ready by the fall of 2010. My son created the website and my daughter wrote a blog to attract customers to the website. I did the planning in my spare time and my husband ran production and sales. The four of us were co-owners, but the vision and strategy was mine, so I became the chief executive officer. During my vacation time and weekends, my husband and I made visits to potential customers, makers of reusable cloth diapers. And that's where our first big order came from. Within one year, the fabric became a bestseller by our modest standards and it was deemed to be the best in the market. We had to keep prices competitive with overseas imports. So our margins were low, but our confidence in the quality of our fabric was high. In 2012, I acquired a Canadian company, Wazoodle, with an online web store and added more fabrics to our product line. I'm now the CEO of both the businesses. We invested our earnings back into the business and developed more specialty fabrics. AKS is a textile manufacturing company now with expertise in design, engineering, raw material sourcing, and fabrication. Our experience in fibers, lean manufacturing, quality, and supply chain, and our focus on sustainability have made us a global leader in specialty fabrics that are safe for the environment and safe for end users. Our business designs and produces high-performance, custom-made fabrics desired by entrepreneurs and industry giants alike. We also make our own lines of fabrics and have engineered some of the top brands for absorbency, food safety, waterproofing, organics, athletic performance, antimicrobial protection, and more. And these go in a wide range of applications in the automotive, apparel, food, furniture, industrial, healthcare, oil, hospitality, and the military. Made from the best yarns available, our textiles have gone up in space with the astronauts, and they've been part of the Winter Olympi Olympics torch. They're used in gear for America's armed forces and they perform every day throughout the world. They meet mil spec, food safe, flame retardant, and other US certifications. We are one of the few textile manufacturers in the, so in the United States that sources our raw materials in the USA, and we partner exclusively with American mills for production. And that's because our mission is to create jobs in America. In our manufacturing journey, we came across other small textile businesses that had machines to finish fabrics, but they were sitting idle, so we, we partnered with them to create a supply chain. By 2013, we were exporting some of our fabrics and had made maybe six overseas customers in four countries. Orders had to be paid for in advance, so that limited our sales. We could not offer credit terms because we had no way of recovering the money if our foreign buyers defaulted on the payment. I was introduced to the Exim Bank in 2013 at a trade seminar and learned about their export credit insurance program. That claim is a blessing to us 
as it enabled us to offer credit terms to our international customers and encouraged them to place larger orders. The customers saved on shipping costs and ordering larger amounts, and we were able to give them volume discounts. It was a win-win situation. Now that we could offer credit terms to overseas customers, it leveled the paying field and gave us an edge over international competitors because the quality of our US-made fabrics was superior. Exim's team of professionals has been invaluable in helping us navigate its ex export tools, and we have benefited immensely by using Exim Bank. In 2011, we had six overseas customers in four countries. Today, we have more than 800 customers in over 60 countries. We are very proud of our American textile industry and grateful to our vast supply chain of textile businesses. We work with over 50 small mills. And I'm happy today to recommend Exim Bank to, any, to other small businesses so, so that they're also able to use the resources. I'm sorry I'm out of time. So in closing, I would like to thank you all for listening to me. And I'd like to thank the Exim Bank for helping a small business like ours compete globally and export American-made goods. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sharma. Mr. Wilburn, good to see you again. You're now recognized for five minutes. It's a pleasure, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, the honorable members of this committee, committee staff, invited guests, and members of the public who are here today. It's an honor to be here before you uh, to speak on one of the most critical issues I think facing small business exporters today, and that's the reauthorization and fully functioning establishment of the Export Import Bank of the United States. Uh, my name is Steve Wilburn. I was born December 19, 1948. Uh, I'm the oldest of nine kids. My father served honorably in World War II, worked his way through college at the age of 42 getting his degree. He gave us an example, a hard work ethic. I grew up as a minority. I talked to Madam Chair about this. I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois. East St. Louis, Illinois is primarily a black community. So we joke about that, but it's not a joke. I learned at an early age that there were issues based on racial and economic barriers. I've fought my entire life to overcome those racial and economic barriers. I, after graduating from high school, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, 1967 fought in Vietnam as an infantryman, was wounded, medevaced back to the United States, nine months in the Great Lakes Naval Hospital, and I'm here today as a 100% disabled veteran, uh, and I'm also a small business owner. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Firm Green. Firm Green is a company that I established to take advantage of some patents that I had created uh, in, the, in the area of renewable energy and energy storage. We found out that those uh, particular items were of particular interest overseas. Our country is blessed with an abundance of energy resources, especially lately. We have natural gas resources. We have oil resources. Most of the places I do business within are energy poor. They're economically disadvantaged. They're also poor when it comes to energy and energy infrastructure. My company helps fill that void. Uh, fundamentally, I'm an energy executive and an inventor. I'm always curious about things, and I try to improve uh, those types of systems that I see that are inefficient. As sort of reference, I spent two years on the advisory board of the Export Import Bank as a small business representative. I also recently completed a two-year term on the Trade and Finance Advisory uh, Council to the Department of Commerce. While I served on that, I was primarily interested in what was happening in the trade uh, enhancements offered by China and South Korea, two of my major competitors worldwide. We issued reports and gave direction. Hopefully, some of those would be acted upon to uh, Secretary Ross and the department officials. More importantly, I come here today to put a face, although your face is much better, as a small, medium exporter, Ms. Sharma. Uh, my old weathered face, I, I want to tell you that I represent thousands of small business owners who are also exporters. We're the backbone of this economy. We create jobs. We bring ingenuity. We bring creativity. More important, we don't just export goods and services overseas. We export hope. We export a vision of what their country could be from a democratic standpoint, if they were free to 
exercise like we do in this country. They don't have those opportunities. I'm most proud of exporting hope. When I look in the eyes of the children at the Gramacho landfill in 2011, we were invited to build a gas plant there. They picked the living out of the trash. There's an infamous documentary, please I encourage you to look at it, called Wasteland. These children and the mothers worked and toiled in that landfill pulling out recyclable materials. Some of them died in that landfill as a result of that, being run over by bulldozers. When I went there, I said I would participate in the bid project. We used XM Bank as a backbone in order to get to the bid, but I insisted that they pay the children and the mothers in order for us to participate to relocate them. The government paid them $25 million as a result of us drawing a line in the sand. So when we talk about the Export-Import Bank and we talk about these things, I wanted to put a human face on it. When I look in the eyes of the children and the mothers and the people that I work with overseas, we bring them hope, not just goods. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. I will now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Mr. Wilburn, you came before our committee almost five years ago. At that time, I entered into the record a letter you received from a potential buyer regarding a project you bid on. Unfortunately, despite your clearly superior product, the buyer went with a foreign supplier because they were certain to get financing from a foreign export credit agency. How has the uncertainty around XM affected your business? It's been tragic, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, since that letter, that was a $57 million project that we lost to the South Koreans. Uh, that was on the heels of our successful $49 million XM Bank facility in Brazil. So we've been invited in a number of countries as a result of that work that we did perform. Since then, we've also lost in the Philippines 275 megawatts worth of solar projects. Uh, we were selected by the Department of Energy and in 2017 issued contracts to proceed contingent upon ECA financing. That never materialized because of the bank. And that's just a few of the examples, Madam Chair, of the impact of a non-functioning export-import bank on my business. Thank you. Could you expound a bit on the impact to your workers when decisions like that are made by foreign buyers? My workers are like family. I'm a small business. So when I have to lay off people because of the inability of me, and I take this my responsibility to perform as the CEO, we lost, we're down to four employees today from a top of 35. We're struggling to survive, but we're surviving. Uh, this Marine don't quit. I'm going to adapt, I'm going to improvise, and I'm going to find a way to get those opportunities. And if this committee and the Congress would be so gracious as to put the XM Bank in a fully functioning status, I'm sure I can increase the number of jobs, bring back those family members, and not I don't mean directly related family members, but those employees that I lost. Thank you. M Ms. Sharma, I want to thank you for being here today also and sharing your story. Can you explain why you've made the decision to keep your supply chain in the United States, and how does XM enable you to compete effectively, especially against sellers who might have the lower cost products? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would like to really explain that. When we came to the United States, we came to settle down here. We came to adopt this country as our own. So when we started this business, the idea was not to bring fabrics from overseas. We found that the textile industry, when I learned the textile industry in the United States, used to be great a long time ago. In the 1990s, the jobs being started, being like the work went overseas, and many of the mills closed down. In our manufacturing journey, we found many small mills, knitting mills, finishing houses, many of which were not used. The machines were sitting idle. Maybe one third of the building was being used. So that's when I talked to my husband. I said, what if we use these machines to make our fabrics and design the fabrics because they don't have the, the, the ability to export or make fabrics even. So we started designing our own, and these are the mills that we use. And the, the people out here are so knowledgeable. They have so much of, uh, uh, what do you say, innate experience that was not being used. 
So we decided to use that, and we thought, if we put up one machine, we can make one kind of fabric, but if we use the, the idle machinery of America that mm. is not being used to manufacture these, we can make a whole bunch of so many different kinds of things and be able to showcase the, the excellence of US-made products. And the, the American worker is really hardworking. The quality of those milks is, uh, mills is outstanding. We don't have a quality control department because we don't have to. A supplier chain takes care of it. People don't have to inspect our fabrics when they come in. They don't get bad quality fabrics. They, do, they, they wouldn't even send them to us. So we believe in those mills. And that is the reason we decided to keep the entire supply chain within America. And that has allowed us to really uh, develop a whole, a whole different range of fabrics that is not there anywhere in the world. And that is the reason why, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes distinguished ranking member, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes for question. Well, uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Uh, Mr. Camphausen, uh, in your testimony, you note how Chinese banks have provided subsidized financing uh, for 5G globally, um, and including uh, especially Huawei's uh, actions globally. So as, as we seek to prevent China from um, setting the network standards for the future, what can we do to better promote our company's competitiveness, and what can we do to cooperate with allies to ensure that Beijing doesn't militarize these new technologies? Thank you, Ranking Member McHenry. Um, I think it's important to understand the differences in the Chinese system, perhaps, at the outset. China is not a party to the OECD arrangements, and so it's not constrained by the reporting and accountability procedures that uh, the United States and her allies would be, for instance. They also uh, disaggregate and diversify their export credit support in ways that require some effort to, to, to uh, fully understand it. They provide um, export credit insurance through Sinashore, which has provided up to 500 billion in assistance in the last six years. They, there is a China Exim Bank, um, and our own Exim Bank has estimated that they've provided in 2017 about 36 billion in uh, export credit finance. But they also use Chinese uh, policy and development banks to provide export credit assistance. And this is where it becomes especially difficult to understand or to aggregate uh, what they're providing. For instance, um, US Exim Bank estimates that China Development Bank provided Huawei, a company that is a global leader and, and a competitor for 5G, um, uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, export-like financing and uh, totally perhaps up to $10 billion a year. Um, I noted in my testimony that uh, Huawei undercut Ericsson in Netherlands very recently, I'm sure you've seen this, by 60% uh, in terms that were only possible because of uh, the, the use of uh, export credit finance that it had gained from Chinese development and policy banks. So I think the first step is to understand uh, the, the nature of what we're competing with, and I think we'll, that will uh, make some important progress. So first understand it, but what, what do you do in response? What should we do as policymakers to ensure that we're responding and competing on 5G? Uh, 5G is a complex issue, as you know. Uh, it's, uh, there, there's advantages to, be, to being the, the uh, uh, early uh, uh, leader, uh, both in terms of the patents that will then provide um, uh, resources uh, and, and require payments uh, down the line. Um, uh, I think we need to think holistically about the opportunities that 5G represents, and, um, and so you know, the, the opportunities that, uh, that this committee is considering, I think, are important ones as well. Maybe I can come back to you with Ms. some Dempsey. more concrete examples. If, if I could add on that, I think one of the most important things that we are hearing from our manufacturers is assuring robust competition in this market and supplier diversity. No one wants to be limited to a sole source supplier, and we shouldn't have our allies similarly be li being limited to sole source suppliers. So in, in the context of this hearing, is there, and, and, and the Exim Bank reauthorization, 
Is there more that the Exim Bank can, can do to promote our exports, to promote our participation in, these, uh, in the development of 5G internationally in a way that, that promotes competition, prevents sole source suppliers like what we've been talking about, and really has more supplier diversity? I, I, I think there are some ways we can do that. Mr. Wilburn, uh, are there ways that we can simplify the paperwork uh, requirements for small businesses so they can better access XM Bank financing? Uh, Ranking member, that's an excellent question because it's overwhelming for a small business to comply. But I understand the need for due diligence and proper vetting of all these. Uh, what does the paperwork look like? What does the paperwork look like? Uh, Massive. Massive. All right, so we could simplify that process a little bit. Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Sharma, uh, would you agree? Absolutely, I would ag agree with that. It is very daunting for small businesses like us and even micro businesses that our customers are like to able to, 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 to complete paperwork and go to a bank. It's really daunting to make it simpler would be much Sure. Easier. So there should be a technology solution as we move forward uh, and, a, and a mandate on XM to actually come to uh, really the private sector standards for, for completing these loans and application reform. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters, for holding this hearing. Thanks for your engagement on this, and uh, look forward to continuing the bipartisan uh, uh, approach that this committee um, is desirous of on XM. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I just want to take this opportunity to also thank uh, the ranking member for this important hearing. Ms. Dempsey, while I am a strong supporter of the bank, I believe it should be doing more to provide financing opportunities for businesses in Puerto Rico and the other U.S. territories. They are all U.S. territories. For example, since 2014, the bank has provided only 65 million worth of financing to only 29 businesses in Puerto Rico. This compares to the bank's total financing of $37 billion to more than 4,900 businesses over the same period. How can we help the bank provide more financing opportunities for businesses in Puerto Rico that are American businesses? and the other territories. Thank you, Congresswoman. I would love to work with you and certainly with the Exim Bank on opportunities to grow Exim's ability to help exporters in every state and territory and Puerto Rico. Um, part of it, I think, uh, one of the things we've seen with our small businesses that haven't used XM or aren't exporting is first making them aware of these uh, opportunities. As, as you heard from uh, Ms. Sharma, she didn't. She wasn't aware of it. We've had lots of companies who, when they started, um, when they found XM, they were able to double and triple not just their export exports, but their employment. Uh, and so that's really important. I think getting more word out, and I'm happy to to follow up with you and and work on a plan for that. That would be great, uh, Mr. Hernstad. Do you have any recommendations for how we can help the bank improve financing opportunities for businesses? in Puerto Rico and the other U.S. territories. Well, I would agree with what's just been said. I think the question is making sure that we have enough reach, that people know that the bank is there, that the bank can give support, and then to make sure it happens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dancy, in FY 2018, Exim approved more than $451 million in support of minority or women-owned businesses, accounting for 21% of all the bank's small business authorizations. While I'm very supportive of this number, I believe the bank can improve in this area as well. What recommendations do you have for improving the bank's outreach and financing opportunity for minority minorities and women-owned businesses. Thank you, Congresswoman. Manufacturers very much support uh, diversity in our own workplaces and the diversity of uh, 
uh, women and minority owned and, and other manufacturers here. And there is work that the Exim Bank is doing. I was just uh, participated at a small business roundtable on Friday with the uh, new chair of the Exim Bank, Kimberly Reed, and was talking with her staff and, and uh, the chairman about ways to get more word out on uh, these issues. Uh, we work with um, a lot of these types of businesses at the NAM, and we have uh, uh, a lot of contacts that we're going to be willing to share and, and, and working on some outreach efforts in that way. Um, it's not only the outreach and providing the information. It's a commitment from the bank to make it a priority. Because after all, most of exporters are small businesses. I agree. I, you know, I urge you to talk to the bank and, and the new chairman. I believe that there is that commitment. That's what I heard on Friday. But obviously, it would be important for you to have those conversations. Uh, Ms. Dempsey, as you know, the bank was with our quorum for several years. And many of us here in Congress felt the bank's operation were severely hampered by the lack of a quorum. As we consider the bank's authorization, what changes should we make, if any, to ensure the bank's operations and its overall authority are not inhibited by the lack of quorum? Thank you, Congressman. The loss of the quorum was devastating for many of our large and, and small businesses. I believe that to do a successful reauthorization, the uh, Congress needs to fix the quorum issue. The, the, the reauthorization needs to provide that the bank will continue to be able to consider all deals going forward. There's many different ways to do this. There's ex officio members and others. I don't want to put myself in your place, but I think there are ways to do this. Without that certainty of having a quorum, we, uh, we are going to continue to lose sales. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today to talk about renewing the Export-Import Bank. A special thank you to Commissioner Kamphausen for your expertise on this issue and for mentoring my excellent legislative director, Rachel Wagley, who previously worked for you uh, at the National Bureau of Asian Research before I hired her way. This is an incredibly important discussion with major implications for America's economic output and competitiveness in global markets. For reauthorizations of any kind, Congress must take the opportunity to consider whether any reforms or changes are warranted. I want to focus today on better understanding how XM's financing helps us compete with China's global export credit subsidies. China's industrial policy, Made in China 2025, is aimed at rapidly expanding its high-tech sectors and developing its advanced manufacturing base. Mr. Kamphausen, can you explain how the Chinese government uses its banks and state-owned enterprises to pursue its strategic priorities, including Made in 2025 and the Belt and Road Initiative? Thank you, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to remember my time with Rachel. Uh, if we think of the, the Chinese system in a comprehensive way in which policy and financing are intertwined, um, I think that helps us uh, have, a, have a sense for how the Chinese leadership can, can describe its priorities and then very, in a very seamless fashion, uh, the variety of export um, assistance financing tools then can can achieve those uh, national priorities. And so it's the case that um, policy drives investment much more than uh, simply the investment opportunities themselves. I've often said that uh, in 15 years, Eurasia will be littered with failed BRI projects precisely because the Chinese leadership intended for there to be funding and finance for projects and whether they resulted in meaningful and um, useful uh, projects in the end was not as consequential as the fact that the loans were made in the first instance. So it's important to understand that very different approach. It's not to say that the Chinese are looking to lose money. It is to say that uh, policy drives investment to a much greater extent. Well, and Commissioner, and to that point, I, you know, in the past decade, China has, has helped finance at least 35 ports, 63 coal-fired power plants, 
41 pipelines in oil and gas infrastructure pipelines, as well as 203 bridges, roads, and railways. In total, over 600 global projects have been partially or fully backed by the Chinese government. Ms. Dempsey, there is concern that many of China's infrastructure investments are predatory and involve opaque terms and conditions since China does not comply with uh, the 1956 Paris Club standards. How do you think we can help draw China into better adherence with international norms, including those surrounding debt transparency in particular and responsible lending? Thank you, Congressman. I couldn't agree more that the loss of these types of projects and, and U.S. involvement is costly to our businesses, our workers, but also our broader interests as a nation um, as we're going forward. We can, the first thing that, that I believe Congress has to do is reauthorize for a lengthy period a robust Exim Bank. We cannot compete or, and draw China to the negotiating table successfully from a stance of weakness. If we don't have a reauthorized, robust Exim Bank, China has no interest in negotiating with us. That being said, there, there is work that is being done with the G12 group of com, uh, countries, including China, to bring them to the table to stop the subsidized financing, to stop the predatory uh, activities, and to improve transparency. I talked to Chair, uh, Chairman Reid about this on Friday. There's a commitment there, but I, the first thing we've got to do is get this bank up and running for a long time so China knows that Thank we you, are Ms. serious. Thank you, How much export credit financing does China offer annually? Do you know? Top of your head? I might turn to Mr. Kampelsen if he has that number. It's really hard to estimate because of the very disaggregated way they do it, but probably in excess of $50 billion a year. Wow. All right. Uh, my, my time has uh, expired. I, I, I thank the witnesses, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the ranking member as well. And I'd like to acknowledge my support for the XM Bank. I believe that it has served a meaningful purpose. And I'm also very pleased that we are making this bipartisan effort to do what Ms. Dempsey has indicated and to make sure that we have a robust XM Bank going forward. Uh, the XM Bank is quite unique. It makes deposits. Uh, other banks receive deposits. It makes deposits. Um, it's estimated that the XM Bank in 2019 will remit $614.4 million to the U.S. Treasury. And this is after expenses and expected losses. Since 2000, the XM Bank has generated $14.6 billion to the Treasury. Some things bear repeating. $14.6 billion to the Treasury. Has a very low default rate, averages at about 0.3%. Usually, the obstacle, the argument for not extending some entity is that it is losing money or it costs too much. But we have a functioning facility that's making a difference in the lives of Americans, providing jobs. In my congressional district, Alone, the XM Bank has made a difference. And my guess is most of us can make similar claims. So the question becomes not whether we should extend it, but how do we do it and make it even better to the extent that we can. Ms. Dempsey, you used a term that I like. You said robust. Would you kindly give some indication as to your definition of robust? Of course, Congressman, thank you. Robust means for a lengthy period. We, what is a lengthy period, if I may ask? Uh, if, if I wrote the rules, I would talk about nine or 10 years. Um, we need that certainty. And when our, our small manufacturers in particular saw the gaps 
and saw the weakness in the Exim Bank, they turned away from exporting. And that's not what we can have if we're going to continue to have robust manufacturing job growth in America. I'd like to see as long as, 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 as Congress can do. Uh, second, not having the disruptions, the quorum issue I was discussing with Congresswoman Velasquez, solving that problem as part of the legislative mandate is critical. Then I think it's important to look at other ways to revitalize. In 2015, Congress lowered the cap for authorizations to $135 billion. Is that something that Congress needs to relook at in the face of this growth that we're seeing in these, these foreign state-owned uh, export credit agencies, particularly China, which is much, much more active than we are. If we're going to put our manufacturers on as strong a footing as possible, we need to look at that issue. We need to be growing our support here, particularly for all the reasons that you, you mentioned, that it's returning money to the Treasury, that it has a low default rate, and we've put in additional controls on risk management, on ethics. That was all done in, in 2015. And then are there other flexibilities that the bank should take to be able to more nimbly counter the uh, threat that we're seeing out of these foreign export credit agencies? And then I go to our small businesses witnesses. Is there more we can do to cut red tape for small businesses so more and more of our small businesses can export and use these opportunities to help us grow jobs? Does anyone else have an opinion with reference to the length of time that we should extend? Uh, Congressman, with all due respect, I think it should be for, I agree with uh, Ms. Dempsey, should be for as long a period, seven to 10 years would be, I think, something that I would feel would give a clear message to my overseas clients that we're serious, that the agency won't have the rug pulled out from under them like happened to me in the Philippines and some of the other areas, especially Africa. Right now I'm working on a number of projects we've invited in, but ECA uh, is mandated for us to participate. China's there investing billions in infrastructure. So my answer is as long as possible, sir. I'd like to thank everyone, especially those who are engaging in this bipartisan process. I think it can be meaningful, and I support the XM Bank. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for uh, you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. I very much appreciate it. Uh, I think most of my colleagues who have been in Congress for any period of time know that I am a farmer by trade, and therefore I am an eternal optimist. It will rain when you need it, and the sun will shine when you need it. Therefore, that same level of optimism brings me to believe that shortly uh, we'll reauthorize the Export-Import Bank and that that reauthorization is literally inevitable because we as member of Congress, members of Congress want to move the economy forward and create opportunities for business and those people who make their livelihood uh, from those businesses uh, back home. Export-Import reauthorization does exactly that. And the district I represent, the third district of Oklahoma, is Ag and Energy. Yes, we're oil and gas, and or wheat and cattle and cotton and a whole variety of things. The one common thread in my district economically is we produce more energy and ag products than we can possibly consume. And we have to have the ability to move our products into the world markets if we're gonna have a price. Now, I am a strong supporter of the Export-Import Bank simply for the very reason. As an Aggie, I have to sell into the world markets. Manufacturing in this country has to have the ability to sell into world markets or they won't have a price either. And the folks who work for them won't have a job either. So to the panel, I ask the, uh, the following question. And note that I understand in these hearings, we tend to discuss things several times in a row. But part of educating my colleagues, myself, uh, and the process we work through is repetition, consistency, focus, burning it in, so to speak. So I asked the group, uh, how vital is a healthy export-import bank for global competitiveness for our exporters here in the United States? And again, reinforce if you would, and if you disagree, I'm gonna be horrified, particularly why a long-term reauthorization uh, is so important compared to this knee-jerk year two or three stuff we've been going through recently. The floor is yours, ladies and gentlemen. 
Let me just start. The re reauthorization of the Exim Bank is vital to thousands of small businesses and tens of thousands of suppliers to large businesses every year, hundreds of thousands of workers across the country. And if we don't do it for a long period of time, a certain period of time, we are going to risk our jobs. We are going to leave our manufacturers and our farmers and our energy producers outside while other countries fill the void. Absolutely. Uh, one more th sorry. One more thing I would like to add. When we do our strategic planning, we do it for a longer period of time. So when we are developing something and trying to export it overseas, there's a time period to it. And when you start seeing the results, by the time you start seeing the results of that, at that time, if there's uncertainty, then whatever you have invested into that business is kind of lost. So it is important to have a long-term plan and a long-term secure um, approach to authorizing the Exim Bank. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Mr. Hansen, you testified uh, and explained that Export-Import works at no cost to the American taxpayer, correct? Yes, sir. Maybe I should just, uh, I should just leave my colleagues with uh, this thought which is in this session of Congress, we're working with what uh, our media friends like to refer to as a divided Congress, Democrat House, Republican Senate. And that, of course, makes it more difficult to force things through. I would argue, again, as that eternal optimistic farmer whose glass is always half full, that makes it easier to achieve consensus. Consensus. And we're lucky that export-import uh, reauthorization, until the last few years, has traditionally been one of those consensus processes where for reasonable periods of time we've reauthorized the program. I would just simply conclude by saying to my colleagues once again, we need to do this. We have to do this. We have no other choice to do this. Let's achieve the reforms that are doable, but let's not create something so complicated, so cumbersome, so inconsistent that it's unusable. So not only does that hurt our competitiveness uh, from a business perspective around the world, it hurts every individual whose livelihood is, is affected, impacted by manufacturing and world trade. We cannot let that happen on our watch. So, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member, thank you for this hearing. Thank you for what I believe is about to happen. Let's just get with it. Yield back. Wow, passion, enthusiasm. <laughs> The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't, probably won't have the same enthusiasm as my colleague, but um, at least visible, uh, visibly. Uh, let me ask all of you this, this question. Um, uh, based on my experience here, <clears throat> we go through this imprudent and self uh, uh, torturing system of, uh, you know, setting dates to renew the national flood insurance, uh, uh, the debt ceiling. We're the only nation on the planet that allows our debt to run out and then Congress fights over it. Um, how many of you would agree that maybe we ought, in, in terms of our competition with China and, and others, maybe we ought to have an open-ended uh, system whereby we have a review every uh, three or four years uh, because Congress can discontinue any program that it wants to discontinue. So if we just just approve this like we do everything else that, that we really believe in, uh, you know, the, the 12 uh, financial services uh, agencies that we deal with, I mean, nobody would, cons would even remotely consider uh, funding the IRS for three years uh, or OCC for, for four years. How many of you would agree with a, that an open-ended and a review process uh, would be healthier in terms of our internet, with, in terms of dealing with our international competition? That, Anybody? That Great. proposal would certainly add so much more certainty to the process and, and help revitalize. Um, I would just urge, uh, you know, we want to see this done quickly and we want to see it done as, on as a bipartisan basis as possible. Does anybody disagree? Uh, let me, um, Mr. Henson, uh, you know, I have a, a, a list of all of the subcontractors 
uh, in uh, my congressional district. And um, the, the only pain I have is the fact that um, none of these are, are companies that are, uh, are either uh, led by minorities or women. And, um, and so that causes me some pain. I'm a strong and probably irreversible supporter of, this, of the XM Bank. But I think there has to be some intentionality about trying to make sure that, uh, that, that there are subcontractors or contractors uh, with XM Bank. What, what, what do we need to do and what could, could, could uh, the U.S. Chamber do to, to, to help us? Well, thank you for that question. You know, the U.S. Chamber is committed to, certainly committed to diversity, certainly committed to supplier diversity. Uh, the U.S. Chamber recently launched the office that I'm a part of, the Institute for Diversity in Emerging Businesses, with a focus on supporting middle market diverse companies and help them gain access to supply chains uh, of corporations uh, as, well as, as well as governmental agencies. It's an important, it's a, it's a good question, and it's an, it's an important question because it, it speaks to the multiplier effect that these companies can have on the U.S. economy. It speaks to job creation. It speaks to, it speaks to essentially creating uh, a, a much more level playing field um, for all businesses uh, across the country. So the U.S. Chamber certainly is supportive uh, of, of anything that creates a level playing field, anything that creates a stronger, more robust, more consistent business environment. So maybe we need to put it in legislation. Maybe, uh, maybe we need to, uh, and I, you know, it wouldn't be uh, something that I would prefer, but, but I'm not sure that there's any other way to, to make sure that, there's, that people are, are actually trying. Uh, if we had to depend on putting some kind of a section in the legislation that would uh, require uh, a level of participation, uh, not unlike what the chairwoman did when she uh, organized the uh, OMWI, um, you know, uh, or, or the, any of the other uh, federal programs we have, wh where we unfortunately have to demand that there is minority participation. Would you uh, think that, that that would be a way? Yeah, of I, I think you know. I mean, the, the work on OMWI, adding an OMWI office to uh, Exim Bank would be helpful. I think that I think that directionally, uh, you're correct. I think it's important to to recognize that we don't do anything to hurt the ability for businesses to grow of all sizes, position states, but to enhance that the economic opportunity that XM XM uh, provides, uh, particularly for fast-growing minority and women-owned businesses. So, yes, I think the certainly the U.S. Chamber would would not look dimly on that, as well as the other things that were mentioned by the panel in terms of more training for minority-owned firms and, and exporting, more outreach, all of those, uh, those sorts of things. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lugemeyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here today. I know, um, Ms. Sharma, in your uh, testimony or your comments a while ago, right here, uh, you indicated that you've got about 50 small businesses that, that you buy stuff from to be able to uh, assemble and, and manufacture your, your goods, is that correct? Correct. Mr. Wilburn, how many small businesses do you uh, buy parts and things from to be able to do what you do? Uh, in the Brazil project, we bought from small, exclusively from small businesses. Uh, there were 42 vendors. Some okay. of them were minority owned and women owned. We tried to accommodate that. But I would say the answer to your question is in the dozens. Okay. To me, this is, a, this is a weakness in the description of how we talk about XM from the standpoint. We talk about how many direct small businesses it's helping, but I can tell you, and, I, and, and full disclosure, I have Boeing, one of their plants in my district, another one just outside of my district. To manufacture one plane is 1,800 small businesses. 67 of those small businesses are in my district alone. But 1,800 of those small businesses get around the United States rely on Boeing to be able to buy those parts to be able to exist so I would hope that down the road we can look at the numbers differently with XM from the standpoint of how many direct small businesses that it's impacting. I know, uh, I think Ms. Dempsey, you made a comment all ago about thousands. Um, do you have some data on that? Or are you just kind of pulling the number out of the air? Or are you kind of guessing where, where it comes from? 
Can you so, help me? So we know from the, from the data of Exim Bank that there are thousands of direct small business users of the bank each year. But to your point, we don't actually have the full numbers, and it's a bit hard to get um, of how many small businesses supply to other to the direct XM users, and you've heard from small businesses that themselves have 10, 50 small it wouldn't, uh, To me, it wouldn't be very difficult to compile that number. I have to do it, just say, hey, what, who, how many, we just got the numbers here from these two. Just have that as a number on your application. So it gives XM a better way of disclosing actually how many different entities it's helping, because I think that would really help sell the, 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 all of us on the importance of that, and then finally get an understanding of how impactful it is in our, our districts alone when you realize that some of the parts that are being put together on those planes in, in my district, they're coming out of uh, Mr. Lottomelk's district or Mr. Lawson's district over here. Uh, those would be helpful to have us do that, uh, be able to have those informa that information, so thank you for that. Um, the second thing I want to talk about are caps. I know that there's a, there's a concern out there that there's a, there's a, there's a rough draft floating around that put caps on the amount of investment uh, opportunities that can be taken advantage of by certain entities through the XM Bank. Again, I think it goes back to we're helping lots of different manufacturers across this broad spectrum of things here. Can you guys give me an idea on, on what your thoughts would be on, on that? Uh, Mr. Henson, you, you, you represent the Chamber of Commerce. This is a direct in, impact on all of the folks across the board on this. On the issue of caps, I should probably defer to, to Linda. She has a better uh, knowledge on, okay. on, on that position. We have seen these proposals for some sort of caps or concentration limits or restrictions by firm, by sector, and I think exactly to your point, doing so hurts jobs, hurts small businesses, hurts all businesses, and does nothing to counter the growing threat that we're seeing from these foreign export credit agencies. Every time we say that a certain firm or a certain industry can't use XM authorizations and XM tools, we are essentially outsourcing our manufacturing and jobs. And so okay. I, we have a lot of concerns down there. So that. to me, this is important from the standpoint of getting at that argument, from the standpoint if you understand all the other businesses that are impacted by the ability to finance a Boeing or a GE or a Caterpillar or whoever it is, those folks buy lots of other parts around the country, and I think it would be helpful to be able to understand the importance of that uh, issue with regards to caps. Um, has, has there ever been a study done with regards to the potential of where XM could be? Uh, as we get these trade deals done and level the playing field across the world, uh, how much potential is there for the United States to be able to become even greater, a greater manufacturer and exporter of goods and services, and, and then have XM be a potential uh, partner with them. Has anybody done any studies on that? Chamber, perhaps, or uh, Ms. Dempsey? I've not seen that study, but what we can use as a proxy is the export financing that our competitors are, are doing overseas, okay. right? The amount of business we lost, you're, you're saying? Yes, yeah, so we're, you know, in a lot of these cases, we could have been supplying those products, right? During the period we didn't have a, a quorum, um, Americon, a, a small company that makes school buses, lost a deal to Angola, um, putting, you know, workers at risk in the United States. That deal went to Brazil, not because they had better buses, but because we couldn't use XM. Every time these foreign export credit agencies are, are winning deals, in, in most of those cases, there could be a U.S. competing product, product if XM is fully authorized, is robust enough to compete. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a, a couple comments and then a question. I'd, uh, Ms. Sharma, I, I got to tell you, it tickled me when you talked about your son building the website and your daughter blogging about your project products. So, I mean, that's how a company really gets started, you know, a family company, and it, it just uh, it sounded great. The, this hearing, and I appreciate the testimony of everybody, uh, but for me, this is the, so simple. I mean, we need to have an export-import bank. Um, the ideological arguments that have been made by some people in the administration, by our former chairman, just make no sense, um, especially in a world where we have China putting all sorts of money behind its companies, Italy, Korea, South Korea, whatever. It makes absolutely no sense uh, to me. And I guess my only question, uh, I'm kind of with uh, Congressman Cleaver, 
that we ought to just say we have an export-import bank, and if a future Congress at some point says, no, we shouldn't, then, you know, we'll worry about it then. But let me just sort of get some numbers. So, Ms. Dempsey, would you object, or how do you feel about a 10-year uh, extension? Manufacturers would very strongly support a 10-year reauthorization. Mr. Hearns, that. Yeah, I agree. Predictability, consistency, a fully funded bank with no caps would be absolutely admirable. Mr. Henson. Uh, always an instance where you create a level playing field and consistency will, is, uh, will be supported by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Camphausen. From the perspective of the message it sends to China, I think that would be a very strong one. Ms. Sharma. Uh, that would that would really help us develop more fabrics so that, I mean, we are here for the long haul. If Exim is here for the long haul, it helps us better. Uh, do your kids still work for you? Oh, yes, absolutely. All right. I'm just curious. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, My son is there taking care of the business right now. All right. Good. Mr. Wilburn. Thank you. Absolutely. Anything that would add certainty uh, to the process for us, we support 100 percent. Okay. And I guess just as a member of Congress and this committee for a long time, there are, everything can always be improved. We can get rid of some of the paperwork, we can streamline it, all those kinds of things, but that's just something you do from year to year with anything. And for us to lurch and stop and start and not having quorum for this organization, for this entity, to put our people at a competitive disadvantage has never made sense, and I just appreciate the testimony and. With that, I yield back to the chair. Mr. Perlmutter, um, you just asked the question of all of the witnesses about whether or not a 10 year reauthorization uh, would be the kind of uh, reauthorization that they've been alluding to. And you, we just got a strong response from all of our witnesses that a 10-year reauthorization would provide the kind of certainty that is so desperately needed in trying to you know, uh, uh, compete in this highly competitive export business. So I'm very appreciative for that. And that's one of the items that Mr. McHenry and I are working on as we try to come to a consensus about what um, this reauthorization will be. It is difficult work. Uh, we have some questions that still need to be answered, but I'm appreciative for uh, what you have shared with us thus far, uh, because we have members who are listening very closely to you, and it's one of the issues that Mr. McHenry and I will have uh, on our list of things to resolve. So I want to thank you, Mr. Perlmutter, for entering into that uh, discussion. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you holding this hearing. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Camphausen. Uh, your testimony was very revealing regarding China's efforts to capture market share in innovative technologies, including 5G. Do you think it would make sense for the XM Bank to take a new emphasis on promoting American innovation in these spaces? It's a bit outside my expertise, but it, it certainly would not send a, a wrong signal to China. Um, I think it's also important to note that there are other tools that we can use. And um, earlier, Ranking Member McHenry asked, what should we do? Uh, last year, the U.S.-China Economic Security Review Commission recommended that Congress um, uh, develop a plan to uh, provide resources to countries that are considering the, the challenges they face from China. I'd like to highlight that in 2018, while it wasn't part of officially uh, funded resources, the USAID sent an interagency team to Myanmar that helped the government of Myanmar reduce the, the, the very challenging Chinese BRI loan for a Great. port by more than 80 percent. And so Thank I you. think we can do those sorts of things. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up to that, Ms. Dempsey and Mr. Henson, uh, do you believe if we have a new emphasis on these uh, innovative technologies, they should come at the expense of uh, current loans or supplant current loans, or should they, should it be in addition to, uh, in a way that where we build additional capacity and expand those efforts? 
Thank you, Congressman. I believe very strongly that it needs to be in addition to the existing financing and activities of the Exim Bank. I heard from many small businesses as I was coming here for this hearing, um, you know, manufacturers, Chuchi in Florida, that makes patio umbrellas. Uh, a company up in, in Massachusetts, Riverdale, that makes lobster traps and wire meshes for fence. We don't want to disadvantage these job creators in our country. And as we look at the size, relative scale of China's export credit agencies and the Exim Bank, we're 200 million, they were 36 billion. It doesn't make sense to eat into that 200 million dollars, does it? That's exactly right. We need, that's where I was talking earlier about expanding the cap. Right. Could, I, could I just say, it's I'd, not I'd just like in innovative give, areas, it's also in infrastructure and yep. beyond. I'd like to give Mr. Hinson a chance, too. Yeah, thank you for the question. We, we would agree with uh, Ms. Dempsey. Um, thank you. you know, in addition to. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Luchmeyer's questions on small business were, uh, I think, informative in your answers about uh, the supply chain, uh, Mr. Uh, um, Hinson or Ms. Dempsey, do you believe that we should have one of the reforms in the way we count our small business, um, uh, you know, effectiveness of the Exim Bank to include supply chain companies? You want to start? Yes, we, that, yes, we agree with that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we agree as well. Great, thank you. Um, and again, uh, Mr. Hinson, I don't think you, Ms. Dempsey was very clear on concentration limits. Would you like to also be clear on the uh, effect of concentration limits and what that would do to those small businesses? Yeah, it's not an area of my expertise, so I would, I would defer so to you. So if, if a big company can't get loans because of concentration limits like Boeing, what happens to their suppliers? Do they get business? No, as a practical matter. It, what happens to American jobs? Do they go up or down? They go down. Thank you, that's what I needed. Um, Mr. Camphausen, and uh, with uh, due respect to our ranking member, uh, North Carolina and Ohio both contributed to the birthplace of aviation. Ohio contributed the brain power, and North Carolina contributed the wind. So um, we needed them both. It's very tired, it's very tired. I know, Steve. I know. But uh, China is very focused on aerospace in their China 2025. Uh, specifically, you know, they are uh, trying to gain more aerospace um, market share. Um, do you think uh, having a successful civilian aviation industrial base um, that can produce wide body airframes will enhance China's military capabilities as well? Certainly, potentially, yes. So would you say it's a national security issue that we support our aerospace industry? Yes. Thank you. Uh, finally, I have five seconds. I want to give a quick shout out to a bunch of small businesses in my district that use the Exim Bank. And um, I appreciate the fact that the Exim Bank is there. Thanks for having this hearing, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Mrs. Beatty who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and to the witnesses, thank you. I have a brief uh, comment that I want to give before uh, having a few questions. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I really want to also say that there's been a lot of emphasis on business development and competition or competitiveness abroad with regards to the Export-Import Bank. There are important conversations, but I, I want to take a moment to thank the American workers. Mr. Hernstadt, as a representative of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, can you briefly describe the impact of a fully functioning export-import bank uh, on the workers in your organization? Absolutely, and thank you very much for the question. It has a tremendous, uh, uh, it's a tremendous factor. All one needs to do is take the public tour of Boeing in Everett uh, to take a look at all of the aircraft that are being uh, built with suppliers from around the nation uh, that have a, a foreign airline stamped on the tail, and then look at all the workers that are involved in that to realize the importance, the direct importance uh, of the bank. 
And all one needs to look at is the development of large commercial aircraft in China to see the impending threat, particularly when they have their own export credit agency uh, that is uh, okay. supporting them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Henson, first, uh, let me also thank you and on a personal note say uh, how pleased I am to see you and I have followed your work uh, over the years. And I want to thank you for standing up, not only for the American people, but all of your work in diversity and inclusion, not only in the position you're in now, but in many capacities. I consider it an honor to ask you a question uh, today. Um, we have heard, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Cleaver and others for introducing AMWI uh, and being in the bill, and thank you for saying that you think that would be a positive thing. Uh, I also have an interest in uh, small businesses. My, my question to you is, when we talk about XM and, the, and fully integrating the ideas of diversity and inclusion into every facet of the work and the culture to attract to retain and to sustain a workforce that mirrors the richness of American diversity. Can you tell uh, this committee why the Export-Import Bank is such a critical and crucial agency for minorities and women-owned small businesses? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but I'd like to focus on one, and that's capital access. Many of the, uh, for many of the minority and women-owned exporters, Exim Bank is it in terms of their ability to uh, attract the capital to actually sell their goods and services abroad. Uh, in the absence of the Export-Import Bank, these companies would not have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to actually participate in the global markets. I would also add that when you look at the growth of minority-owned and women-owned businesses, the growth is really with African-American female-owned and Hispanic female-owned businesses. Those will be the exporters of the future. And so it's critically important uh, that the Exim Bank be here to help these companies gain access to the capital that they, they need uh, to expand their businesses and export abroad. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that uh, as many of the minority and women-owned ex export small business would be able to do as many deals internationally if they didn't have the Export-Import Bank? I think, it's, I think it's without question they would not. Uh, what's unique to minority-owned firms is they have unique export capabilities that more traditional firms don't have. We're talking about uh, these companies generally have, they are, are six times more likely to transact business in a language other than English. They are uh, twice as likely to export than non-minority-owned firms. We're talking about cultural connectivity. There's a big component of gender connectivity that's oftentimes not discussed when U.S. companies export into other markets. Uh, and so we don't take full advantage of the full breadth and depth of the skills and capabilities of these firms. In the absence of the uh, Export-Import Bank, these companies would, would, would fall short. Well, let me say again, I don't have my time is running out, to all of the panelists and especially you, Mrs. Dempsey, for also using in your testimony words like fair playing and level playing field. Uh, I fully support the XM Bank and would like to see us move forward. I thank the chairwoman for this bipartisanship. And lastly, I had the honor to work with and have in my district the former chair, Fred Hochberg. My time is up. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you to our witnesses today. Um, and um, thank you for the testimony from many of you, particularly uh, Mr. Uh, Camphausen, about the Belt and Road Initiative and the serious national security implications of, of uh, China's malign state-directed export financing efforts. Uh, I do, uh, in that vein, I do sympathize with the testimony that we've heard here today that uh, one of the principal goals of the Export-Import Bank uh, is to enable the United States to compete on a level playing field in markets and industries where China is aggressively supporting uh, their own exporters. Uh, I am, however, alarmed when I see uh, on the screen above all of you all uh, the fact that China is the number two destination of XM Bank-supported exports. And the fact that XM has subsidized Chinese companies, and in some cases, Chinese state-owned enterprises, and even the Chinese government. 
And so my question to you on behalf of the American taxpayers, and anyone can chime in, but in particular because of your expertise and your interest in the topic, Mr. Camphausen, why is it or why should it be U.S. policy to use U.S. taxpayer funds to subsidize Chinese companies, including Chinese state-owned enterprises? Thank you, Mr. Barr. I'm not an expert on the, the functions of U.S. Exim Bank. Uh, it is the case that as China has developed so rapidly over the last 30 years or so, many of the old rules that were intended to, to engage and to bring about a, a, a China that would be a, a more meaningful partner for the United States in the international system require reassessment. And uh, I, I think that applies across the board. And so um, a general statement would be we need to reevaluate re the conditions that would allow this very thing I, to occur. I welcome that comment. And my question uh, may appear to the many friends of the XM Bank in this room as a hostile question. It really is not. It is to invite that kind of feedback that we need to reevaluate um, the, the policies of the XM Bank with respect to the core mission of countering malign Chinese competition. And uh, I think that if we're going to attract support for reauthorization, particularly long-term reauthorization, we need to be very cognizant of the policies of the XM Bank so that we do not continue to subsidize Chinese importers. Um, I think the American taxpayer, particularly American taxpayers who have read uh, Michael Pillsbury's book, The 100-Year Marathon, uh, that explores Chinese industrial espionage and forced transfer of technology and theft of intellectual property, uh, I think the American taxpayer would be alarmed and concerned to find out that their hard-earned tax dollars were going to actually subsidize uh, malign competitive activities from Chinese-owned businesses. And uh, I do see Ms. Dempsey wanting to chime in, and I will give you that opportunity. Congressman, thank you. I appreciate that. And look, I, I, we care deeply. Our, our biggest competitor and the source of most of the concerns I hear from my members is China. It's our third largest export market. These exports support hundreds of thousands of jobs overall. Why do companies use XM to sell to China, including to China state-owned enterprises? And it's not taxpayer subsidized, right? Companies are paying fees, the loans are being paid back, it's actually not being subsidized, and maybe there's more work we need to do to prevent that. Consider one of my small manufacturers in Maryland. They sell medical rehabilitation equipment, about 55 manufacturing workers that they've been able to double over time because of exports working with XM. They sell to hospitals in China, in Russia. Most of those hospitals, are, many of those hospitals are state-owned enterprises. Our goods, our American goods that go overseas are like our ambassadors. Yeah, I understand. I'm, I'm going to have to reclaim my time. I do appreciate the comment, but I, I, I want to just reemphasize re that it's, I think it's in order to gain the support that you want to reauthorize the bank, um, when we're talking about competition with China, I, do, I think we need to have a, a, a clear-eyed policy with respect to supporting Chinese state-owned enterprises when China is engaged in systematic th theft of our intellectual property, systematic national security undermining efforts to transfer American technologies in a way that undermines U.S. national security. So I, I just admonish the panel here that, that this is an important issue that Congress cares about, as do you, because the, the, the issues that you are talking about in terms of competition uh, raises the concern of malign competition from China. We should be cognizant that we don't unintentionally enable uh, China, China's uh, mercantilist, uh, communist-driven um, activities that actually undermine U.S. national security, and I yield back. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank the chair lady and ranking member for calling this important hearing and all of the uh, important witnesses today. I am a, a strong support, a supporter of the XM Bank uh, and feel that it should be reauthorized, but certainly questions and oversight are important. 
uh, particularly when you look at the extent that our competitors in trade subsidize their countries. Uh, China is uh, subsidi subsidizing their exports to the tune of 36.3 billion, as in B, a year, compared to the United States. Uh, we're number 25 on the list, they're number one, and we're at 200 million. Uh, but I think the gentleman did raise an important point that you don't want to subsidize the selling of technology that is important and protected uh, by CFIUS uh, for our national security. Uh, but since there are no indications that other countries will dissolve their export banks, uh, and we cannot change this in reality, we're making it very hard for our, our companies to compete in the new world economy. So I'd, I'd like to ask the representative from NAM, uh, Ms. Dempsey, uh, could you please explain exactly what type of difficulties American exporters would face if we did not reauthorize the U.S. X, XM Bank, and specifically when facing foreign competition that are gr aggressively backed and subsidized by, by their nation's uh, export uh, banks? Would more American companies simply lose bids in the world economy and world competition? Ms. Dempsey. Congresswoman, thank you for your question. The simple answer is yes. If we didn't have XM to participate in a number of these, these deals, small businesses would lose out thousands. Hundreds of thousands of workers each year would be losing out on opportunities. Um, and we are going to risk our standing in the world. When the U.S. exports our product, our best-in-class products, whether it's medical equipment or satellites um, or the, the great products our, our small business witnesses here are talking about, we are, are, are being an emissary to the, the rest of the world, and that helps us in our standing. Mm -hmm. We should be looking favorably at exporting products of all sorts, of all sizes, of all types, everywhere in the world, and I, I with, with respect to, to Congressman Barr, including with respect to China. We have rules, as you mentioned, Congresswoman, uh, the new Export Control Reform Act to make sure that we are not exporting our sensitive technologies. We have a U.S. Trade Representative working very hard right now to get the best modern rules with China to stop the theft of intellectual property. But if we cut ourselves off from exporting, including to hospitals with which we're not competing globally, if we cut ourselves off from providing our best in class products to Chinese consumers or other consumers, we are hurting our diplomatic standing in the world. Uh, can you uh, get us in writing, since this debate is going to continue for a while, uh, real examples of how we have benefited uh, companies? I'd particularly be interested in New York companies, that's where I represent, but other members are interested in their localities. I'd like to ask the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, David Henson. And I, I worry a lot about today's uh, sort of debate and discussion um, in, in today's economy. Now we're in a very good, strong economy, and we are exporting but what about if we had an economic downturn, like in 2008 when we were literally uh, in a tremendous uh, stress position, and, and there's uh, not a lot of, there wasn't a lot of private uh, capital around to say the least. Uh, we were dependent really on uh, the government to get the economy moving and to sell, help during this stressful period. So uh, can the XM Bank uh, offset a major shortfall in commercial credit and prevent a dramatic, uh, say, drop in exports during a financial crisis? And did it do so during the 2008 recession? Can you tell us that experience during that time of financial stress? Thank you. Yes, and thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I think you know, your question is excellent because that's exactly what happened. During the economic downturn, XM stepped up uh, and filled the void that commercial banks were unwilling to fill to support U.S. companies exporting abroad. So, I mean, you're right on point with that. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and that's one of the strengths of XM during the times when we have economic downturns, and we will have another uh, at some point. XM is in the position to step in and provide the sort of capital and, and, and loan supports and insurance supports that the private sector can't, uh, could not provide. Well, you make a very strong argument for reauthorization. My time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one reason uh, our country has enjoyed uh, 
relatively great economic success is because we trusted our economic well-being uh, to a free enterprise economy. In 1974, the uh, late Nobel Prize winning economist, Milton Friedman, uh, said you must separate out being pro-free enterprise from being pro-business. Today, we consider the reauthorization of an institution that many see as pro-business, uh, but certainly not as pro-free enterprise. The Import-Export Bank has been criticized by many uh, as picking winners and losers and providing financing to uh, large companies and government enterprises. Uh, for example, one study identified Premex, uh, the state-owned Mexican oil company, to have received the largest value loans from the bank. When the bank's reauthorization lapsed a few years ago, uh, we learned that the bank was financing the purchase of American commercial aircraft uh, by a foreign airline, which was uh, unfortunately, uh, competing with our airlines and costing us uh, jobs and a boost to our economy at home. Uh, we've recommended reforms to the XM Bank before as part of reauthorizing it, most of which have been ignored. Uh, I believe we should look at reforms uh, as part of the reauthorization and, and want to ask some questions about uh, some reforms and, and start with uh, Commissioner uh, Komphausen. One of the reforms that has been suggested is that applicants for bank financing be required to prove that they cannot get finance elsewhere. Uh, should that be a required reform? I don't have any expertise, uh, Congressman, on that question. I, I'm afraid I can't answer. Anybody else want to comment? Uh, Congressman, uh, there have been studies and uh, reports by the GAO and perhaps the OIA, OIG, the Inspector General, that have looked at this issue of additionality and has found that XM is complying with the rules, that it is um, not entering into areas where there is a commercial source of funding, financing, or other export activity. Um, I believe that this, this activity is already being dealt with very properly by the XM Bank, and I urge you to talk to the new chairman, Reed, ab about this, but I don't believe that there needs to be additional work over the restrictions that, bank, that the bank already has as a lender of last That's resort. Good. Another form that's also mentioned would be to raise the requirement for the bank uh, to target loan support to small businesses. Uh, part of that has been a recommendation to redefine a small business. Uh, to exclude many firms that most observers wouldn't consider to be a small business. Uh, should we take steps to put more emphasis on bank loan support to small businesses, Commissioner? Again, sir, that falls out the uh, falls outside the parameters of the, the work that the commission does, so I don't have an answer for you. Congressman. Uh, other thoughts? As, as we've discussed earlier, even our large business exporters actually support ten, hundreds, if not tens of thousands, of small businesses in their supply chain. Right now, there is a target percentage that XM is trying to meet. Over 90% of the transactions last year were with small businesses directly, but many more small businesses uh, win and participate when there are these large business exporters. So I do not believe that there needs to be any change in that rule. Question three, the bank has often provided loan support to state-owned enterprises uh, that ought to be able to get fine financing within their own countries uh, or from their own governments. I mentioned uh, the Mexican state-owned oil company as an example earlier. Uh, why is it appropriate to provide finance support to state-owned companies? And I should give you first chance. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is perhaps an area that requires fundamental reassessment, um, especially in light of the very opaque ways in which China uses its own export uh, support agencies, export credit agencies, as well as policy and development banks to form that, to, to serve that very function, but in an kind of unsupervised or unaccountable way. So I, I think it, it merits reevaluation. Congressman, if I could. If we restrict the ability of XM to finance uh, sales to state-owned enterprises, be it in China, be it in Mexico, what we will be doing is telling China and, and other countries, 
buy your own products, do not buy USA products. I think that would be the wrong path to take. Are there ways that we should look at this? Should we do some more analysis? I absolutely agree. But I, I do believe that most of the exports that we've seen that have been financed by XM me, are the difference between whether it's a US worker who benefits or a Chinese worker who benefits, a US worker or a Mexican worker. We need to be working to advantage our small businesses. Time's expired. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck, who is uh, a leader on this particular issue and an expert for this committee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and I thank the panel very much for being here. In particular, Ms. Sharma, I found your story incredibly inspiring. And Mr. Welburn, welcome back. Thank you, sir, for your service to our country and Semper Fi. So what I've heard from the panel thus far is they uniformly support increased overall capacity and growth in a responsible way for the bank. They do not support concentration caps. Uh, and if there are to be carve-outs, they cannot be deductive against the overall capacity. And the panel additionally supports longer-term uh, life for the bank. Me, too. I have been a strong supporter of this bank for two reasons. The first of which is the competition's in on the action here. Every industrialized nation on the face of the earth has an export credit authority, and I believe every single one has export credit authority activity as a percentage of GDP larger than the United States. And to, to assert a variation on what Ms. Dempsey said earlier, in the last two years, China has extended more export credit uh, authority uh, to businesses than the United States XM Bank in its entire life. Two years. China more than our Exim Bank in its entire life. Second reason I support it is markets fail. Now, Mr. Williams often asks, are you a capitalist or socialist? I'm a capitalist, but markets aren't perfect. Markets don't always help small businesses trying to get into this. Ms. Sharma's story is a perfect example of this. Uh, markets don't always support sales into developing countries. The reference to Angola is perfect. Markets don't always provide support for long-lived, large-dollar capital goods, and the XM Bank does. And they've done this, by the way, in a spectacularly good fashion. In the last generation and a half, if not two generations, they've generated billions of dollars and created hundreds of thousands of jobs. They do their job well since 1990, without question. Without question. Now, one of the seriously con under considerations proposal is to provide a concentration cap. I've heard everybody here oppose that. I want to drill down on it, Ms. Dimsey. The most common reason offered for this is risk management. But I read the data differently. Uh, I was looking at your testimony where it indicated that the default rate was less than 0.2% at the end of 2014 when we had large business activity, and it's increased 2.44 something percent, doubled. The default rate doubled. Now the truth of the matter is the statutory cap is 2% default. They are still the envy of the private sector for their management of risk. But what that data suggests to me, Ms. Dempsey, is that these large items, long-lived capital goods, are in fact the gold standard of their credit worthiness, and taking them out of the portfolio would be a little bit like an individual removing treasury bills from their portfolio. Do you agree or disagree? I absolutely agree, uh, Congressman. What we've seen is, is that the larger exports, the capital goods, are the more secure, less risky. The aviation sector, in particular, has a default rate of 0.009, I think, in the last year, and in, in back in 2015, it was 0.007. That is far lower than the 0.235%. So it would be counterproductive from a risk management It would standpoint. be absolutely counterproductive from a There's risk There's no management. business case whatsoever to be made for doing that. There is no business case, and I will tell you, we've seen what other, uh, let's say, the French export credit agency has, tr has done and how they've operated when they've tried to put these concentration caps in. You have French government officials trying to pick winners and losers. This is absolutely antithetical to the, the rule 
rules put in in 2015 that we shouldn't be discriminating against particular exporters. So in my time left, I just want to say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, they are my friends, stop saying this is taxpayer subsidy. It isn't. It hasn't been for decades. This is a job-generating, revenue-creating entity. It creates jobs, it transfers revenue in the billions of dollars to the Treasury. It is not taxpayer subsidized. Stop saying that. It's not true. This helps America's economy. This helps us be strong. This helps us compete with China and other competitors. That's why I am so glad to hear your testimony here today and the consensus of your high points. Thank you again very much for being here. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you all taking the time to be able to be here. Uh, Ms. Dempsey, you would uh, mentioned a little bit ago in regards to uh, the account of GAO and uh, the Export-Import Bank, uh, in regards to uh, the Export-Import Bank being the lender of last resort. Um, both studies out of the GAO and the Export-Import uh, Bank's Inspector General, General have pointed that the bank doesn't always demonstrate that it is indeed the lender of last resort. Uh, can you explain the discrepancy uh, between the bank's mandate and its function, given that the bank is statutorily required uh, to not compete with the private sector? Thank you, Congressman. Um, as I read the last OIG's uh, last report in November 27th of 2018, what it said is, quote, we found the XM con generally conducted sufficient due diligence and adequately interpreted the need for additionality when authorizing transactions. The bank generally complied with the additionality policy and procedures. The OIG went on to make several recommendations to the bank to strengthen those procedures, and the um, executive chairman uh, or uh, vice president, Gutman, uh, confirmed in writing to uh, the OIG that the bank was going to undertake to take all of those reforms. We have just had a new uh, board finally installed, and I urge you to, to have those conversations with the bank. But as I read the last report, there is uh, the, the work that the bank is doing is ensuring that, that, that it is the lender of last re resort and that the bank is willing and able to take other actions to uh, reconfirm that. Okay. Could, could you maybe explain, and I'm, I'm just trying to be able to make sure yeah. we fully understand this, how does the bank know when U.S. banks are unable or unwilling to be able to provide financing? The bank is, all the applications that come into the Exim Bank are required to provide that information to the bank, uh, and then the bank puts that in their decision memos going forward that this information has been collected from the exporters seeking uh, information. So the exporters actually tried to be able to get it in the private sector, they've been denied, and that is put into their request? Uh, yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that they, they, all the applications require uh, the reason for XM support, which goes to the fact that they've been in the private sector. And I've seen this directly, and I'm sure my, my small business colleagues at the end of the table could speak to this. Um, companies try to go and uh, to a commercial bank. They don't want to. They are unable to. Bank lending rec requirements, in some cases, prevent them from financing a deal to parts of sub-Saharan Africa or other parts of the world. Companies are unable to use exports as collateral when they're getting a loan. So our companies have no choice but either put out a second mortgage or go to the Exim Bank. And that's the, the important role that the Exim Bank places to fill gaps. Great. Uh, can, can you maybe clarify for me, and uh, Mr. Hex, a good friend of mine, uh, appreciated his comments, but he was talking about the default rate. And uh, obviously, as he had noted, uh, the default rate of XM Bank is low uh, compared to the private sector. So that does beg the question, you just cited some regulations, but it's not across the board uh, in terms of all of the loans going on. Why is the private sector not stepping up and taking those loans given the great risk management that we've seen uh, coming out of the XM Bank, uh, given the statistics that are available. 
Thank you. I, there's a number of, of reasons that we don't see the, the gap being filled, and, and I laid these out in some specificity in, in my testimony. Um, certainly emerging markets is a big problem, right? Your local community banks are not, are unwilling and unable to finance those types of deals. When you have longer uh, transactions, uh, longer term transactions, larger transactions, banks alone are unable uh, to, to take that risk on by themselves. In some cases, they do partner with the XM Bank. Uh, to uh, work together, but uh, acting alone, the bank is unable to, to take on that risk. I talked about the small business, collateral, exports can't be collateral, which is normally the way that small businesses get loans. That, that operation does not work in the private sector. And then we were all discussing with state-owned enterprises there and in you know, a number of energy deals and other deals, you absolutely need a government at the other end of the table, and that is the important role that the Exim Bank serves. Great. Uh, my time's expired. I yield back, I'm sure. Thank you. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for convening this hearing today. And to the witnesses, thank you very much uh, for sharing your testimony. Uh, the Export-Import Bank has been critically important for boosting North Carolina's economy and creating good paying jobs. Uh, in my district since 2014, it has supported 142 North Carolina small businesses and larger companies, generating more than $4 billion in sales for our state, uh, all without adding a dime to our national deficit. Uh, in Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, which is my, my district, the XM Bank currently supports 17 businesses engaged in exporting, which generates sales of $60 million and thousands of jobs. So it's my hope that we can uh, strengthen and reauthorize uh, the bank uh, well in advance of the September expiration date. I, I do have a few questions uh, for uh, Ms. Dempsey. First of all, um, when the Exim Bank lapsed between uh, July 1, 2015 and December uh, 2015, the statutory authority of the bank was significantly limited. Uh, the bank could not approve new transactions, was prohibited from engaging in business development and so on. So could you paint a picture for us of what those five months were like uh, for existing clients of the bank as well as new prospective manufacturers relying on uh, this affordable financing to grow and expand their businesses? Thank you, Congresswoman. They were devastating. Um, our phones were, were lighting up constantly uh, with companies who had deals pending who couldn't make those deals. We had um, small businesses uh, worried about making payroll because they couldn't complete an export transaction that was a significant part of, of their deal. And new businesses were question and, and new users of the bank were questioning, well, why should I even try to export and do this? Uh, when this bank is not in operation. Uh, we saw our foreign competitors uh, being able to complete um, tens of thousands of deals um, that period and, and through the period where we, it was not fully functioning, um, all, I think, to the loss of, of American workers. Thank you. Um, Mr. Welburn, did you want to add something to it? I'm sorry. I would just say this, that small business just like any other business, needs certainty, okay? There's very little certainty in the process today. Uh, my clients overseas have gone to my competitors reluctantly, and that costs jobs in your district and other districts. I think that's really what we need to focus on. You talk about free enterprise. We engage in free enterprise at Firm Green and these other businesses. What the detrimental effect is, the government policies surrounding XM Bank hurt us and hurt our clients overseas. Thank you. Um, if, um, what would American manufacturing and small business engagement with the international marketplace look like uh, without XM Bank? Uh, Ms. Dempsey and uh, uh, Ms. Sharma. I, I'd like to say uh, we support a number of businesses in North Carolina also. And those businesses, I mean, we do the exporting, but they do the work. Okay. So we send them cotton yarn, they spin them for, they knit it for us, they finish it, they dye it. So businesses like us support a number of other small businesses that don't have access to exports. Okay. So without Exim Bank, that kind of 
uh, activity is not possible supporting those kinds of businesses that are really not upfront exporting okay. by themselves. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We would see thousands of businesses each year, small, particularly small and medium size, lose anywhere from 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 60 percent of their business if we didn't have XM. That would put at risk hundreds of thousands of American jobs. And if we stop doing this, we would continually lose out in, in bigger and bigger numbers because when we lose a sale overseas and our competitors get it, that may not just be that one sale, that may be a sale for years, for generations to come. Okay. And so we are putting ourselves at risk. So before you turn to the Exim Bank for financing assistance, did you attempt to get financing from more traditional banks? Yes, sir. Always, okay. uh, Congresswoman, always. It's a, first of all, I, I'd like to help my local bank <laughs> and they would like to help me, but they're precluded mm -hmm. by the rules of their own banking charter from lending especially the collateralization issue you mentioned on the overseas uh, okay. materials. Ms. Sharma, did you? Well, we haven't. It has been very difficult to get loans from local okay. banks. We but have not yet try. used Exim Bank okay. for taking a loan, but we will be. Right. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And Mr. Wilburn, I'd like to uh, thank you, start by thanking you for your service. Uh, as a Marine in Vietnam, our country called you and you answered the call and for that we owe you a huge debt of gratitude. Your success in the military and the private sector are encouraging example of hard work and commitment and I'm grateful that we're able to hear your story today. I too am a small business owner currently for 50 years so we've seen Main Street America how it works. Uh, you're an entrepreneur uh, who started uh, multiple successful businesses. You took risks and bet on yourself to succeed. Uh, that is the definition of the American dream and the beauty of capitalism. Uh, you seized on opportunities, you didn't seize on government guarantees. So before I proceed with my question about the Exim Bank, I want to ask you a simple question. You're a capitalist, aren't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Now, the problems I see with Exim is that the benefits seem to disproportionately be going to some of the largest companies in the world. Could you give us your thoughts on how we can preserve the benefits to small and medium-sized businesses like ours around the country while not subsidizing multi-billion dollar corporations? It's a difficult question, sir, and I think an important one for this committee, obviously, and I appreciate the question. I can only speak from the small business perspective and the people that I know that are small businesses that have worked for these large companies that you're referring to. They are indirect jobs. They don't really show uh, in the accounting at XM Bank or the data here. My work at the Trade Finance Advisory Council with the Department of Commerce, we try to articulate that and draw attention to that. So I think there's more work that need, needs to be done, but I agree with you, there has to be a hard look at the policies behind the loan processes, period. Thank you. Uh, I personally think the largest companies in the country who can afford to arrange their own export financing uh, should do so without any assistance of the federal government. I would prefer a recourse financing system like there is in the private sector between two parties that I deal with all the time. So Mr. Henson, uh, do you believe the XM Bank currently has enough flexibility in its charter to innovate and try and shift the risk away from the taxpayers and increase private sector involvement? Well, I, I would say to that question, um, you know, th from the standpoint of the U.S. Chamber, there's the motivation is to create a level playing field to make sure that all businesses of all sizes and all scopes have the best opportunity to sell their products and services around the world. Um, there's a greater need for flexibility, as, as Ms. Dempsey pointed out in her comments, to grow the Exim Bank to make it more available to more, to more companies. So in answer to your question, U.S. Chamber w is supportive of, of more flexibility for companies uh, and greater opportunity for businesses, particularly small businesses, because U.S. Chamber, 99% of the U.S. Chamber's members are small businesses so that they can grow and flourish. Well, half the workforce, half the payroll is the small businesses we're talking about, so thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Dempsey, uh, on page six of your testimony, you, took about, you talk about how international competition 
is uh, receiving subsidized financing from their respective export credit agencies. You've talked a little bit about that today, and that the United States has been working to eliminate these market distortions so everyone is competing on a level playing field. Uh, what enforcement tools are at our disposal if we find out that another country is violating a negotiated ECA lending agreement? Um, at the moment, we don't have those types of tools. We have agreements that the United States led the world in completing with our, member, our fellow members of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the developed countries uh, that follow these guidelines. Um, and then we're trying to, but we need uh, more leverage in those negotiations with the developing countries. One of the areas that um, we are looking at, because we, we share the view that, uh, that governments should not be using subsidized financing um, and do not believe that at all that that's what the Exim Bank is doing. It is operating as, as on commercial terms as possible. But um, I, I think some of these negotiations, we need to look at the World Trade Organization, because that's where there's an exception for export credit agencies, and that's where the disciplines and the type of enforcement tools would actually lie. So that's an area that we're looking at. I was over in Geneva with my CEO in March. We talked to the head of the WTO about this issue. But that's the course that I think we need to take on that, only after we've fully reauthorize, revitalize this agency, because if we don't have an operating XM bank, no one else is going to listen to us. Okay, thank you, and I yield my time back. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you Madam Chair, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, the committee, and I was just sitting there contemplating and listening to most of the tel testimony early on. And, and, and I guess it's a, uh, uh, one of the things I would like to comment on again that I don't clearly understand, uh, in wake of the numerous trade wars uh, that the President uh, has been involved in uh, with how important is the reauthorization to export and import uh, XM banks to help small businesses that are reeling in from uh, these trade walls. And so in the news every day, it's about uh, uh, direction uh, that the president probably would be going. And, and then you hear uh, a news release earlier uh, from a lot of small businesses saying how this will really, really affect them. And I was just wondering if you all, as we go down the line, uh, care to emphasize, uh, or does it put you in a, a bad position to tell us uh, 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 how these trade wars are going to affect our small business growth? Congressman, um, thank you for that question. Manufacturers, as I mentioned, export about half of everything we produce to our, our foreign trading partners, and that's been a huge source of growth over the last uh, 10 and 20 years. So we need foreign markets to be open. We need a level playing field. We very much want to see um, the better rules with China in, in particular. But at the end of the day, what we want is a rules-based economy. And no one wins a trade war. Tariffs can be very devastating, particularly to small businesses that only have a, have a particular export market. Uh, so we are working very strongly with the administration, with those of you up here, to try to get a, a, a trade policy that opens markets, that sets fair standards for all of our companies, um, and takes away some of these trade distorting tariffs. Anyone else care to comment? I just want to echo her remarks. We want a fair and level playing field for trade. Uh, I can't opine on all the reasons behind a tariff. You know, I'm a small business owner. But I can tell you this, our elected officials need to be very sensitive when they take these types of actions. They're punitive towards us. They hurt our economies. They hurt small businesses like ours. Uh, so we have to be aware of those. Do I have all the answers? Absolutely not. But I know part of that answer has to be a look at fair and equitable trade policy. OK, uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. We've always insisted that a fair trade policy be comprehensive. It has many different components to it. You mentioned tariffs, that's one. The Export-Import Bank is another. We want to make sure that American workers can compete on a fair and level playing ground, uh, and that involves many different aspects and many different factors. Right. Uh, one, can I add one yes, thing? Yes, please. please. 
when we talk about a level playing field in the fabric and the textiles field, we do not have a level playing field because the fabrics that we make follow all EPA standards, OSHA standards. We follow a lot of rules that makes our fabrics safe and easy to use. We cannot com compete with overseas imports that are not made following the same rules and regulations that we use in the United States of America. So by that standard, our fabrics become more expensive. We keep our costs, our overheads low. We don't use agents and distributors just so that we are able to compete with low cost imports into the country. So that's, the tariffs really don't affect our business in that manner because our, we are, our manufacturing supply chain is completely and 100% US owned and operated. Yeah, and and real, real quick, uh, Mr. Henson, uh, before I run out, when you say that we like to have all our businesses, small, medium sized and large business uh, on a level playing field, is that really achievable, achievable? Yes, it is, it is achievable. I mean, we have to put measures in place to ensure that it's possible, but frankly, one step is to have a, a, a large, robust, consistent XM bank to make that possible. Uh, so I, I believe it is. Okay, and real quick, uh, has Congress been providing the resources that it needed uh, to keep us in a competitive situation? I'm, I'm sorry, say again, sir? Has Congress been providing the resources uh, to keep us in a competitive situation? I know things are going on with the Chinese and so forth, but are we providing the resources that keep us in a competitive situation? Ms. Dempsey? I, I certainly think that, that this hearing and the work that uh, the chairwoman and ranking member McHenry and all of you are going to do on this reauthorization is part of that. I think as you look at uh, this reauthorization, the extent of it, the caps and all of these issues to make XM more robust, um, that is going to be of uh, great importance and great urgency to the manufacturing and broader business sector. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield, yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Chair Waters, thank you for hosting this hearing. Appreciate you and the ranking member working together to uh, put this panel together. First, I want to thank, uh, congratulate Ms. Sharman and Mr. Wilburn for you being here today and bringing your hands-on practical experience uh, in using the bank's programs compared to all these very smart people over here uh, who also are advocating, but it's nice to have your perspective of hands-on working. Mr. Wilburn, I note uh, that your testimony, you talk a lot about uh, that you're pitted against other uh, companies that are exclusively using their company, their country's uh, ECA facility. And so whether that's relevant or not to the transaction, it becomes important. Can you touch on that a minute? In other words, whether it's really needed or not is sort of irrelevant to you because it appears to almost be a, a requirement by the, by the buyer. More and more. In the last five years, I can tell you that there's very few projects that we can bid on without demonstration of either a letter of interest or some type of indication that we have ECA financing available from our United States Export-Import Bank. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ms. Sharma, in your, in your case, congratulations on the incredible growth you have. You must not sleep at night in order to go from six customers to 800 customers, from four countries to 60 countries. You, I know you're working your children to death, it sounds like. <laughs> um, there, the emerging market risk, because you have a mixture of entities you're selling to, do you use the XM Bank? primarily in the emerging economies, or do you use it across the board because you yourself are a small company that doesn't have a, a we, big reputation, quote unquote, with the buyer? We have, uh, no, the, uh, it's different actually. We have a great reputation with the buyers mm -hmm. because our fabrics are unparalleled anywhere. We just don't have any marketing or advertising. It's all organic growth. People that use our fabrics, they love it and they want to order more but they're limited again by, uh, by credit terms, et cetera. So mm -hmm. we use Exim's credit terms mainly in uh, different markets like Europe, Australia even, okay. and in emerging markets too. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Dempsey, in your testimony, you, you talk a little bit and outline some of the uh, structural issues in finance that are troubling that again are not ideal. And one thing you cite is the Basel III standards and by also Dodd-Frank have discouraged the private sector from making long-term financial commitments here. Can you explain that? 
Uh, I, I can provide a little bit um, more on that. Um, what we are hearing from our companies is uh, when they go to their, their local lender or even larger commercial banks, um, as the project gets bigger, as the project is in um, emerging parts of the world, be it in Asia or Africa or South America, uh, what they are being told by their banks is they cannot because of the regulations, um, both U.S. government and the Basel III, that reduce the amount of risk that banks can take on, that reduce the, um, their ability and, and their exposure limits. We have seen, in, in several cases, the ability um, of XM to partner with a commercial bank, where the commercial bank is taking part of that risk, and that works. But if you took XM out of the equation, the deal would not happen, the exporter would lose the sale, the jobs would be put at risk. I would also point out that XM is, is looking at, you know, is there more to do in the reinsurance area? I think that's promising for some um, parts of the portfolio, but is certainly not a silver bullet. Um, XM, I think, is taking very seriously now its mandate to be the lender of last resort. It has the flexibility uh, to look at these other options going forward, and um, we support them in doing so. Would you say that uh, the bank is more of a lender now than an insurer of a transaction? I'd have to look at the the numbers. I, because of the problem with the quorum and the lack of the quorum, there were, um, you know, Exim's activity was cut um, by at least a third. Um, there was, you know, a lot of small businesses use working capital guarantees, uh, insurance guarantees, receivables insurance, things like that, as opposed to the lending. And so that activity was reduced during that whole four-year period when um, XM was not operational. Appreciate that. Mr. Camphausen, uh, just a quick comment. Do you think the uh, yes or no answer, do you think the uh, World Bank should treat China as a developed nation now instead of an undeveloped nation? Very complicated uh, question. Give me an uncomplicated it's, answer. Do you I, think it should or should not? Yes. Thank you. Yield back. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Mac Adams, is recognized for five minutes. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. In my home state of Utah, roughly 86% of Utah exporters in recent years were small businesses. So supporting exports means supporting small business in my state, and the Export-Import Bank is, is a critically important tool to help our nation's, our nation's exporters. So stated another way, the Export-Import Bank is a critically important job creation tool right here in the United States. While I wasn't in Congress during the last reauthorization, I was the mayor of Salt Lake County at the time, and I frequently dealt with our small business partners and the broader business community. Uh, working toward reauthorization. And all of these stakeholders were strong supporters of the Export-Import Bank due to its help in leveling the playing field for U.S. companies to compete overseas. So as we enter this reauthorization, a key focus of mine is to strengthen the bank and to strengthen the ability of our small business exporters to compete in foreign markets. So a few questions. First of all, do small businesses and large exporters, this is, I guess, for the panel, do small businesses and large exporters utilize XM in similar or different ways? And do you believe that promoting small business usage of XM has to come at the expense of our larger exporters? Or in other words, can a strong XM bank better support small businesses while also still providing appropriate support for larger exporters? Maybe I'll, I'll take the technical question to start out, but I know my small business colleagues um, have a lot of expertise here. Um, there are certain tools that the Exim Bank provides that are really just for the small, medium-sized businesses, um, and are, those are what they need. Working capital guarantees, uh, some of the reinsure, uh, the, the insurance uh, payment guarantees, some of those are ones that are largely used by small business, and the Exim Bank has put into place uh, activities for first-time small businesses to help ease them into it um, to attract more small businesses to use the bank. Then there are the financing tools that I will say um, small businesses use as well as medium and large businesses. We've got small businesses that export big things like school buses, like fire trucks, family-owned small businesses that do these types of things as well as you know the small businesses here on this panel. They use those same lending resources. 
I believe very firmly that the Exim Bank can and should do all of the above, because as we discussed earlier, these large exporters support hundreds, tens, thousands of uh, small businesses, as well as their communities, right? We're talking about suppliers, component manufacturers, but we're also talking about coffee shops. We're talking about local stores and, and other things that are parts of these communities. That's what Exim can and, and should be doing. R real quick, I also feel very strongly that if, uh, if it comes down to big companies, small companies, due to a lack of resources and proper attention, increase the resources of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. They need more staff. They need more help. That's my opinion. Yeah, I don't believe the small business and large business has to compete with each other. The, the, source, the resources should be increased in order to have both, because again, like Ms. Dempsey just said, the big businesses also support so many small businesses and local communities and stores and everything, the economy. So I don't think there should be a competition between them. Well, it sounds like they're not necessarily a zero sum, right? If we're helping some of the, the large businesses, that will also support the small businesses in the space. Right. So it doesn't have to come as a zero sum. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move to a different topic. And Mr. Hinson, uh, you specifically mentioned in your testimony Canadian planes, Chinese trains, and Russian nuclear reactors as expensive capital goods that are supported by those countries' ECAs. So for U.S. companies in similar industries, when XM is fully operational, does the XM Bank provide comparable levels of support, or do they compete at a disadvantage against their foreign competitors? Or in other words, if XM didn't provide strong support for these industries, would companies be incentivized to move jobs overseas? Well, that, that's a very technical question. I, I would rather defer that question, Ms. Dempsey, because there's a really specific okay. answer to that. Ms. Dempsey? So, uh, a, a few answers. One, if we don't have XM, these suppliers of, in these areas, particularly when you're talking about nuclear or rail, rail cars and things like that, those deals won't happen from the U.S. side. Um, do some of these other countries provide more flexible and subsidized rates? Yes, absolutely they do. Certainly the developing world uh, oftentimes subsidizes using non-commercial rates of interest, things like that. We're trying to negotiate those issues, but we need to do so from a position of strength. I would say that when we look at the whole, um, all the foreign export credit agencies, many are much more flexible in t than, than the United States is. And so that's an area that we'd like the bank to look at. Okay, thank you. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I appreciate all of our witnesses today. Uh, really a lot of expertise and some great comments. Uh, to our small business uh, leaders, I really appreciate that because that's what I did just prior to coming here in the manufacturing space. Uh, and in preparation for my time in Congress, not only did I have this chance to be a small business owner that you may not realize what you're being prepared for uh, as you're going through these things. Uh, but I had a great education uh, at the United States Military Academy, so thank you all for your contribution to my high quality education. Uh, one of the key takeaways from that was that you fight the battle you're in, not the one you planned on being in or the one you wish you were in, but you fight the battle that you must in order to win. And the reality is if we're purists, we don't really like tariffs. And if we're purists, we don't really like subsidized things. What are subsidized things? Things that the market wouldn't produce. And in the reality, our regulatory scheme in the United States prevents many of our financial institutions from taking market risks that they would love to own and hold on their balance sheets. So it's not that the market wouldn't produce this. In some ways, this very body is actively working to kill the market. Uh, that would make it possible to extend working capital to small businesses. For example, Basel III wanted to treat your businesses and mine as if we were using the entire line of credit that was available and assign no assets or equity to it, which is crazy. Everyone looks more levered when you do that. The reality is that we are, as Mr. Camphausen, you've, or Commissioner Camphausen, you've uh, most articulately uh, laid out in a very competitive space, not just with China, but even with our nearby allies, the Canadians. In my manufacturing business, we looked at it and rationally would have moved part of our business to Toronto to take advantage of their very generous uh, comparable entity to the XM Bank. 
Uh, it put us at a competitive disadvantage. And frankly, the United States hasn't dealt with it. Thankfully, we do have a president who has taken the, the trade war. Ms. Dempsey, you highlighted that no one really wins a trade war. The reality is China's been winning, bigly. Uh, they've been winning, and they've been recognizing they've been involved in trade. They, they had a grand strategy for how to deal with the end of the Cold War. And it goes back to prior to the 30-year anniversary of the events at Tiananmen Square, where Deng Xiaoping became the leader of China. So you look at the way they've used their entire economy to engage the world, and they promised to become a market economy, but they haven't. So you're exactly right. We need to use all the leverage of the World Trade Organization to get them to do what they already promised to do. Uh, we need to have a powerful tool uh, like the XM Bank or you have no leverage. And the reality is as much as I dislike the concept of tariffs, we've seen that this administration and our trade negotiators have used tariffs to improve our trade deals and to gain leverage in a negotiation. Because with no leverage, you've got no deal. And with no options, there is no option. There's, you get what you get. And so um, I guess, Mr. Wilbur, Ms. Sharma, would you say that you know, as a, you would love the theory of I only compete with companies, but you feel like you're competing against countries. Yes, we are competing against countries. Hard as it, as it is to say we are competing against countries. And uh, the fact we do dislike tar tariffs, absolutely. Only yesterday we were talking about this, that there's a, a tariff coming over from India and some of her yarn is coming from there. And they said, your price is going to go up by so much. And then we felt bad about it, but then we said, uh, India did not uh, abide by the agreements about raising, of, about not putting tariffs on US products. And we said, okay, you know, we are American citizens. Yes. So we agree. Thank I you. Mean, we live by it, that's it. Thank you for that. And I, you know, Mr. Wilburn. Just real quick. Of course we compete against countries, but really we're competing against the ideologies. I'm a patriot. I love my country. And that has to be recognized when we're doing trade. They're trading with Americans who are engaged in free enterprise. Absolutely. And I think it's well said, and I hate to cut you short, but I'm on a tight clock. Look, I never thought I was going to China without a rucksack full of ammo, body armor, and night vision goggles. But we did a lot of business there. We experienced the trade, the importance of the working capital. We experienced the, the competitive uh, environment. And Commissioner Kamphausen, if you could briefly summarize, how dangerous is the loss of uh, intellectual property to China, and how, is import how important is it that we get that, that we get the, uh, the, the regime that we've put in place last year on CFIUS with FIRMA into uh, XM controls? The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, according to XM, 75% of Michigan customers are small businesses. However, XM, um, I think, provided only about two small, only two small businesses, or only two small businesses in my district have been provided with financing from XM. I don't know if anybody can confirm that, but one of the things I want to talk about is in 2015, XM reported to have supported over 60,000 jobs in Michigan as a result of 9.3 million sales across the state. How many jobs has XM supported nationally? And I apologize if it's been asked already. In a typical year, Congresswoman, um, XM, when it's fully functional, supports um, hundreds of thousands of jobs. We, uh, XM's uh, data says about 2.5 million Mar American jobs have been supported since about 2000. Um, has XM Bank ever put the taxpayers at risk? What we've seen um, in XM every year is putting uh, stronger risk controls in place, as was uh, authorized by the 2015 uh, reauthorization. Its default rate is very low, far lower than the statutory mandate, and we believe that it has the controls it, it, it needs to not put uh, U.S. taxpayer dollars at risk. So my friends across the aisle have claimed that XM has put taxpayer dollars at risk. What are the highest default rate been for XM? I would have to go back and, and look at that. If I may, I will um, respond to you and follow up. 
Um, so going back to st uh, small businesses, so for me, many of my residents, uh, especially if in communities, because I have the third poorest congressional district in the country, and about 70, 60% of my residents within the city limits, within the urban community city of Detroit, uh, work outside of the city. And most of the times, the, the ones that do work in the city, it's because small businesses are higher, not the major one. So, I, you know, I'm curious as what, it, you know, if XM's board quorum is met, I mean, are there any requirements to pl in place to ensure that small business lending targets are met? The XM author reauthorization in 2015 set, a, set an XM small business uh, target. I was over Friday with um, the XM new uh, chairman, Reed, and a group of small businesses and their office of small business. And they are very committed to figuring out ways to get more small businesses involved. One of the problems, of course, we had is during the lack of a board quorum, the gap that we talked about earlier, small businesses couldn't devote the resources to this uncertain future. They need that certainty to be able to do this. Oftentimes for a small business, it's one or two individuals or their children who are out trying to get these foreign sales. And if they don't know that Exim is there, they're not gonna be working on that because they've got payrolls to meet, they've got customers in the United States to service. Okay, that's it, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses uh, for being here today and sharing your testimony. Um, I want to pay particular acknowledgement to our small business owners. Uh, reading your testimonies and hearing you today are so inspiring. My father immigrated to this country in 1960, started a steel plant. Sounds very similar to your experience, Ms. Sharma, uh, where, where the entire family has chipped in through, throughout the entire life of that business. Uh, really resonated with me, so thank you for all that you do. And Mr. Wilburn, thank you for, for your service um, in, in the United States military. Uh, I believe that the value of the bank um, should be unquestioned at this point. Uh, it's exciting to me that, that we're going to get what feels like some bipartisan energy uh, on getting this done. Um, we could talk about low default rates. We could talk about the fact that it's contributing more than it's taking out from the, from the Treasury. Um, the obvious implications with leveling the playing field against China. Uh, and the impact on small and, and medium-sized businesses. Um, and so I, I'm excited about the prospects. Uh, for me, the only question uh, is really one around length of time and confidence in the reforms and oversight um, that you know, we can have if we're gonna go towards a long-term uh, reauthorization. Um, so I guess my first question will be for Ms. Dempsey. Um, given that the bank now can establish a quorum and has appointed a chief risk officer and chief ethics officer, uh, what next steps would you recommend Congress taking to ensure these officers are completing their mandates successfully? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, look, we, we absolutely uh, are committed, like all of you, to making sure that all our government en entities, like the Exim Bank, are operating um, as intended and, and with that low risk. I'm not sure that I think that there is a specific mandates or directions that Congress needs to do right now. The risk officer, the ethics officer, were just appointed last right. week. Um, there are reports that are due from the OA, o, OIG, the GAO to follow on that. The committee could certainly undertake hearings uh, with the bank, uh, meet with the, the, the new chairman of the bank, the other board members, hear what they're doing. I, I don't know that I, I see any specific mandates at this point from a legislative perspective. Okay, um, and then in the GAO report of XM Fraud Controls, their survey found that more needs to be done to leverage technology to help with preventing and monitoring fraud. Um, same similar question, what sort of technologies can the bank utilize to improve their fraud risk management operations? My understanding is, is the bank agreed with the recommendations and was undertaking that again. I don't have the, the specific expertise on that. Um, I don't know if my colleagues do, but I think that is a question to ask Exim Bank um, and uh, understand what they're doing and then perhaps have another hearing or, or discussion. Great, and then if you could expand um, a little bit more on how we can hold China accountable at the WTO and, and, and globally. I, you kind of started down that path and ran out of time a little bit, so maybe say a little more there. I mean, more broadly than XM, I think we are absolutely supportive of Ambassador Lighthizer's work to negotiate a new trade deal with China. It's something that we've been talking about, our CEO talked about uh, at the beginning of last year. 
we have old rules. These rules with China are out of date, um, and they have certainly developed in ways, as several of you have talked about, that no one expected. And um, I know uh, Commissioner Kamphausen can, can, can talk very specifically about the theft of intellectual property as well as many of those things. We need to see that agreement come to fruition, strong new rules with China that holds them accountable through an enforceable mechanism. But we also need to get our own house in order here, and that's where Exim Bank plays such a critical rule. Is there more adding to the work of Exim Bank, not detracting from the support it gives to small businesses that have nothing to do with China, um, but can it do more to um, provide more flexibility, uh, significant authorizations? Is there, are there other things that we can do uh, to speed along that, con to, to undertake that, that countering? Um, okay. we're not to interrupt, but I want to give uh, Ms. Sharma the, the last question. 30 seconds. How can we make small business life easier with respect to the Exim Bank? I think there has to be more outreach. I don't think many people know about the Exim Bank at all. In, uh, in the community that we are, in the small businesses that we are, most people don't have, have, uh, have not even heard about it. There has to be more outreach and education so that Exim Bank can reach more people, and definitely they will benefit. You may have covered this, but how did you hear about it? I was at a trade seminar, and somehow the trade rep some trade representative was there, okay. and he introduced me to Exim. Great. And no doubt it. on one of your weekends. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, thank you for the time, and uh, I yield back. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses today. And um, it is my belief that the Exim Bank plays an irre irreplaceable role in promoting American exports and keeping small businesses competitive on the inter international market. Since 2014, the bank has provided over $450 million worth of export support value in my district, Texas 29, which is the Houston area. Among the 53 total exporters supported in my district, 39 are small businesses. The bank provides targeted credit and export support to our small businesses who need it most to stay competitive. We know the bank's programs work and we should not abandon them. I fully support the reauthorization. However, I do want to add that I am concerned about what may be happening with any of the um, president's uh, tariffs, particularly in regard to, to Mexico. Uh, foreign trade in Mexico is very critical, not only to my uh, area in Houston, but in fact, Texas. If carried out, how would the proposed general tariffs on Mexican imports affect small businesses who specialize in exporting value-added products? Would a revitalized bank be in a position to help these types of businesses? And this question is for Ms. Dempsey. Thank you, Congresswoman. I uh, appreciate your support of the Exim Bank uh, and, and fully understand and agree that um, Mexico is a valuable trading partner. Um, the administration just recently renegotiated, updated, modernized the uh, original NAFTA agreement and is looking for con congressional approval. Mexico is the second largest uh, export market for our manufactured goods. And when we import from Mexico, 40% of the value of those imports is actually US-made content, whether it's our grains or our energy or our steel or other products. Um, we've got to get this uh, situation um, moved forward. We are, are very concerned and have communicated directly with the administration on the possibility of tariffs. Uh, immigration is a separate issue. We have a, a plan we've put out on, on how to move forward on immigration, but we should not be moving forward on, on tariffs at this time. But so you do believe that, that it, the reauthorization of the bank would help those businesses in my district that are directly uh, either uh, exporting to or, or Mexico importing to their to product to them. So the Exim Bank is definitely going to be um, an aid to businesses exporting to Mexico. We've already seen it, its use in um, its Mexico is is oftentimes a, a top market that Exim supply or, or Exim uh, supported exports go to. Uh, so that is a very important um, area where we need to to continue to move forward at this time. Thank you. And while I do support the bank's reauthorization as a necessary economic reality, there are also some problems that, that must be addressed. I know some of my colleagues have already mentioned about the, the, um, the need for growth in the small uh, business sector, uh, but I'm particularly concerned because of those businesses that I mentioned uh, in my district 
only of the 59, only seven are minority owned and only four are female owned. So the next question is for both Mr. Sherman and Mr. Um, Ms. Sherman and Mr. Wilburn. Uh, what can we do specifically uh, to improve uh, outreach to these communities? I know, Ms. Sherman, you mentioned that you learned about it at a trade seminar. Um, you know, what else could they be doing uh, not for all our communities are, that, that really need help uh, in this area, in minority-owned, uh, small dis business disadvantaged, veterans businesses, all our small businesses. Yeah, I, I, that's, 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 I was just thinking about that. How do we get to them? Because it was a shipping seminar. I had gone to find out about shipping to overseas countries, and suddenly I found this. Mm -hmm. You just so, stumbled on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is a very interesting question. What, 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 uh, what, what do they use? in order to send the message to these people. I don't know if the small business owners are parts of some association, some local chambers of commerce through which I mean, Exim Bank could work, uh, so that they're able to reach and send the message out there that this abyss is available, because it's just not there. Okay, Mr. Wilbur. Sorry, just real quick. Uh, there are local regional offices that the SBA and XM have staff and representatives. We're trying to get their word out. I mentor veteran-owned businesses, disabled veterans, and also other minority groups. And there's some mentoring that needs to be taken place and maybe even enabled more by the bank to allow those of us who have experience, like Ms. Sharma and myself and other uh, small business owners, to mentor uh, small businesses to allow them to fully access the capabilities of the XM Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Riggleman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank all of you for being here today. I read your bios, and they're pretty impressive. Uh, my questions, my background's gonna come back. I'm a family business owner myself in the fine, you know, fine liquor. But also, I had two companies before in Connecticut, non-Connecticut warfare. My background is NSA and the Office of Secretary of Defense, United States Air Force. Thank you for your service. And we do have better chow halls than the Marines. So, um, as we're looking to reauthorize the XM Bank, I think it's critical uh, that we take a step back and try to understand how or why a healthy XM Bank is important. Um, I believe economic competitive, uh, competitiveness is as important as a strong military when it comes to national security. Now, listening a little bit earlier, we know that China is not playing by the OECD rules. I think we, we all know that. So I have a question, and this probably isn't fair to Mr. Henson, but I'm going to ask it. So if anybody else wants to chime in, you can. Um, if they're not abiding by any of the international standards, Mr. Henson, and since you're from the chamber, can you tell me perhaps what the structure of one of these deals might look like? You know, do they have an MOU of anything of sort? And also, do you know if China has any arbitrary caps on its investment lines? Uh, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. Honestly, that's not an area of my expertise. We have two people on the panel who know more about China and caps than I do, so I would very much prefer to defer that question to them. Fantastic. Commissioner, Ms. Dempsey. I don't think we have a, a, a firm answer on whether China thinks about caps. I think we can conclude that they probably don't because it's not in their interest to arbitrarily restrict themselves when they aren't a part of any other uh, international bodies. And so I suspect um, that they, they would not self-impose such caps. Okay, and earlier also I heard you talk about, you know, sort of um, China executes its uh, economic investment strategy through policy. And I sort of remember us doing that right after Operation Iraqi Freedom. We did a little bit of that ourselves. Um, and, in, and in saying that, and this is a question for you, and it's actually a true question, um, and I just wrote this listening to all of you, by the way. Um, do you think that the U.S. can combine policy with free market principles to target certain areas? And what I mean by that, the best term I came up with is like international opportunity zones. And seeing that China is using ECAs and supporting funding sources as sort of a strategic cudgel, and being former NSA and OSD, OSD, I know a little bit about Huawei. How would you see the United States combining policy, international free market opportunities, and a streamlined regulatory process to utilize XM almost as our own economic cudgel also? I think we want to be very careful about using um, this sort of uh, tool for those broader purposes. That said, I agree with your the impulse that we must leverage all the tools available, and think up new tools for this competition that we're engaged with in, in with China. Um, the first part is to understand the nature of the challenge, and the second then is to uh, join the competition. And reauthorizing Exim, I think, is 
what the committee is considering is, is part of that. But then we need to leverage our unique strengths. It's, it's not the case that uh, Chinese money is so deeply desired by all these countries that they would uh, look askance at U.S. funding, quite the opposite. And I mentioned earlier, I think before you arrived, Congressman, we actually can do some things that can help to undermine Chinese investment. The example last year in our interaction, a, a USAID-led effort in Myanmar, we actually uh, got the, the size of the loan scaled back by more than 80 percent from what China had originally had said were its terms. I think those are the kind of things we can do that will allow us to compete well. That's why I'm so fascinated by this and, and what and, and the expertise on this panel. And you just said something about we don't think there's arbitrary caps. Do you think XM should have a cap at all? And anybody can ask that question, Ms. Dempsey. I mean, should we have caps on XM at all? Uh, we at the National Association of Manufacturers would strongly advise against any caps. That's going to put jobs at risk. It's going to put small and large businesses at risk. And it's going to reduce the flexibility that we need to counter these uh, foreign export credit agencies. So you're saying that. Uh, oh, go ahead. I just want to add, me, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce are opposed to caps as well. Fantastic. I might be also. Um, and so here's what I want to say about this as we're going forward. Do you think we can create, and this is for everybody here, our own sort of risk matrix investment strategy, sort of a, a competitive concept to move forward, like, like a business revitalization overseas? We, can we have our own sort of overarching concept that defi f defines sort of a streamlined, technologically cogent way forward in certain geographic areas? I mean, is this possible? Do you think we have the capability to do some risk investment strategy that combines policy, free markets, technological innovation, uh, and have that matrix and actually sort of streamline where we want to go, not only just based on free markets, but based on policy and geographic sort of advantages that we might have? And I know I got eight seconds, so I'm sure you can answer that in eight seconds, Commissioner, but what do you think about that? It's well outside my area of expertise, but <laughs> the, the, the answer is um, it's an American challenge, so sure we can do it. Yes, sir. Thank you all very much. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, unfortunately, I had uh, been delayed coming, and so I uh, came out of rotation, but uh, felt compelled. I guess every uh, garden party needs a skunk, while well, the skunk just showed up at the end uh, to ask a, a couple of questions. Um, I, I, I am, but I, I'm fascinated by this no caps uh, notion. Uh, that, that there should be no limits as to what XM can, would, or uh, lend into. Um, and uh, China has been cited, I guess, one party rule does help streamline policy decisions, uh, but we have a responsibility here in Congress to limit the exposure of taxpayers to risk. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you, know, you look back at the history of Export-Import Bank, um, some of the original uh, uh, rationale for this was is that the Soviet Union wasn't going to, they weren't sure we were going to be able to pay for the grain purchases. And so the federal government stepped in to say, okay, we're going to guarantee those. And uh, that, that was a, that's a very different situation than lending a sovereign wealth fund out of the Middle East uh, money uh, to, uh, to purchase airplanes. Uh, that, that is, uh, we've, 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 we've wandered far afield from this, and, and to my small business uh, friends, I'm, I'm a small business owner as well, third generation involved in construction, and, and uh, we've, been, uh, we've, we've, been, uh, we've been battling that, uh, that, that side of the equation to survive for a, a very long time ourselves, and uh, I'll, I'll just note the fact that there was no quorum actually then changed the ratio on the small business lending. It wasn't even close to hitting its mandate uh, and, and did virtually nothing as, uh, as having been the former chair of the uh, Monetary Policy and Trade Subcommittee, I was, I was intimately involved in the, in the, uh, the discussion surrounding Ex Export-Import Bank last reauthorization. And uh, unfortunately, there was, a, uh, uh, there was a kabuki dance around, the, uh, around this notion of reforms that simply have not come uh, to fruition. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled as to why no one actually from the bank or the inspector general is not a part of this panel. Um, and uh, there, uh, it seems to me that uh, not only should, but we must have the bank here to answer some of the questions uh, about risk management and accountability. 
Uh, and exactly how uh, the GAO and XM and IG uh, have, uh, have viewed XM's shortcomings uh, in the past on, uh, uh, on, uh, on protecting taxpayer resources and rectifying the deficiencies in its anti-fraud measures, uh, improving the bank's compliance with underwriting standards and authorization statute. Um, one of the main discussions that we had in our last reauthorization was ha actually having a balanced portfolio. If you put the Export-Import Bank up against any of our regulators of traditional banks, they would not be allowed to do the lending that they do. So um, I, we, we've got to figure a few of these things out. I'm afraid that the majority is bound and determined to plow ahead uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a reauthorization uh, for longer than it should be, potentially with no caps at the, uh, at the urging of, uh, of, uh, of some folks that uh, not, maybe not normally be their, uh, uh, their comrades in arms when it's coming to these kinds of policies things. Um, I, I've got about a minute left here, but Commissioner, I, I, do wanna, I do want you to be able to answer what had been Congressman David, Davidson's uh, question along with uh, Mr. Barr's question about CFIUS and FIRMA controls and, uh, and the dangers with China specifically, and uh, we know about the IP uh, side of things, but uh, you know, how, how are the controls that have recently been put in with FIRMA, um, is it not possible for Export-Import Bank to actually, in effect, go around those? And if, if so, potentially, what can we do to make sure that uh, the spirit of FIRMA and CFIUS and those types of security reviews that are very important are not laid by uh, the wayside. I, I don't think there's a concern with FIRMA, although we're still wait, awaiting the regulating uh, or, or the implementing regulations. With regard to export controls, uh, I, I'm, I'm approaching the, the outer limits of uh, not even my not knowledge but, but imagination. I think there has to be some harmonization to ensure that w there, there wouldn't be a conflict. I think Ms. Dempsey might have a view on this, but I'm, I don't think it would be insurmountable. Uh, the export controls would prohibit uh, XM from authorizing exports of anything that's controlled. The gentleman's time has uh, expired. You can do, uh, answer those questions in writing if you'd like. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for a uh, pretty little marathon session being with us today. I know the, XM, X, the Export Import Bank is going to be a hot topic this year. Um, it's something that we as Congress are going to need to act upon. I've been one of those that's been a little bit of a critic on there. I see both sides of the issue. But I also believe that, that government, as, um, as our founders believed, is uh, a necessary evil. In its best state, it's a necessary evil. In its worst state, it's an intolerable one. Therefore, most of what the government does, we have to narrow down to those things that we think government should be doing. And when we do those things, they should be narrow, limited, and done at their best. With that said, I'm not necessarily opposed to the Export-Import Bank, but I do think that there are some things that we need to look at reforming it as, as we go forward, and I'm hoping that we can do that. On the other side of the scale, I, I do see the need for it, especially from a national security uh, stance, uh, from the subsidization that is going on by foreign countries, many of those that are not friendly to us undercutting the market. So with that said, I'm, I'm eager to the, for the discussion to continue on in the direction we're going. Um, one thing that I am a proponent of is, is including as much as we can in the private sector, much like we do that we're talking about, at least on this side of the aisle, in flood insurance, is including the private sector as much as we can and maybe even moving in that direction. And I understand that um, the bank launched a reinsurance pilot program that shares an additional $1 billion um, in loss coverage for the bank's aircraft financing transactions. I'd like to see us do more of that type of thing. At minimum, we should at least make that program permanent. So, question, Ms. Dempsey, why is it important for us to have, or do you feel that we should be including the private sector in, in as much as we can, and why is it important to share the risk? I, 
I, I agree with that. Um, XM is supposed to be the lender of last resort. If commercial banks can um, participate, if they can provide these tools, I think everybody on this panel, I hope, uh, would, would agree with me that, that, that it would be easier to go to your commercial bank. Certainly our, our, our small right. businesses would prefer to go to their community bank where they know the banker to get those types of tools. The problem is, as we've discussed, there are, are, are numerous areas where commercial banks are prevented. I too think the reinsurance issue is, is an interesting one, and we support that activity. But what we are already seeing is that commercial banks are limited by their bank regulators. Insurers are limited by their, their regulators in terms of the risk and exposure that they can accomplish. Reinsurance cannot take the place of the XM Bank. There are certain markets where you cannot use reinsurance. Uh, think China, think Angola, think um, Russia. Um, it can't be used for project finance. And so we need to be very clear that there are these tools where XM can use more to diversify its risk, although, again, its, ri its default rate is extraordinarily low. It's 0.25%. It got a bit higher without the quorum when it wasn't doing these large deals because, in fact, these large deals are, are, have, been, have been shown to be less risky. Okay, thank you, and, and a quick follow-up on that is, I've got some manufacturers back in my district that feel that, um, and service providers, that sometimes XM, because of just the nature of it, it can provide an unfair competitive advantage to some other businesses, especially when it comes into selling overseas. And so that's just I'm bringing that up as as some of the issues that we're hearing from from different folks on another aspect. And again, I'm I'm open. I'm listening. I do see the need to do this. I, and um, I just want to make sure that we've cleared some of the hurdles that I've had in the past. Um, last Congress, when we were working on reauthorization, the Inspector General had a number of active investigations going on um, regarding uh, corruption and fraud at the bank. Um, one of the IG's most recent semi-annual report to Congress in March said there were 25 open investigations of fraud relating to uh, export credit, insurance, loan guarantees, and others. Mr. Henson, have these been, uh, the, can you answer, have these been resolved, or what's the status of those? Are you aware of these? Or? I'm, I'm not aware of those. Is anyone on the... I'm not aware. aware of the specifics, but of course the chief ethics officer was just appointed last week now that we have the quorum. Um, we, I, I was talking to Chairman Reed uh, just last week. I know there's a lot of interest and, and focus on making sure that the bank um, is following the most ethical standards. Okay. And on the point about picking, you know, favoring particular industries, part of the 2015 reform was to prohibit exactly that type of discrimination. We agree and we would urge the Congress not to move forward with any concentration caps that would, in fact, discriminate. Okay. And thank you all for what you're doing, and I hope we can get to a, a point that, that uh, this will be a, a good reauthorization for all of us. I yield back. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our distinguished witnesses for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned.